Why do you seem so scared? All I wanted to do was play with you. Please come and play with me. I am so lonely. You're not afraid of the dark, are you? Don't be afraid. Come with me. I will show you where I play hide and seek. Do you want to play hide and seek? You hide, and I'll find you. Ted Bundy was not the world's first serial killer. He wasn't even the first serial killer in the history of the United States. Yet, Ted Bundy is pretty much the reason we know about serial killers. He became a global celebrity, notorious for his horrific crimes. He fit the profile of a typical serial killer. He was heartless, ruthless, and devoid of remorse. Death was not the conclusive event of the cruelty he visited upon his victims. For Ted Bundy, expiration only marked a new phase of violence and destruction. The coverage of his crimes extended far beyond the 6 o'clock news. Countless books have been written. He has been the subject of numerous documentaries and feature films. His nefarious influence has even extended to the creation of fictitious villains. He died in 1989, but his infamy lives on. He casts a shadow from beyond the grave as true crime coverage has become more and more popular in recent times. Younger generations continue to discover who he was and what he did. His body may have perished, but the man continues to haunt the multitude as one of the world's worst human monsters. When one undertakes the task of studying serial killers, Ted Bundy is frequently the premier go-to figure for academia. To understand and study serial killers is to learn about the figure most associated with the type of mass murder that is committed by a single offender. As gruesome and brutal as his crimes were, it is also his body count that ranks him among serial killer royalty. The statistics are as astonishing as they are disturbing. Now join me in this episode of Human Monsters as I profile the life and crimes of Theodore Robert Bundy in graphic detail. January 4th, 1974, around 2 a.m., University of Washington student Terry Caldwell retired to her bedroom and went to sleep. She shared the house with three men. One of them peeked into her room at 2.30 p.m. to check on her. Though it was unusual for her to remain in bed so late in the day, he assumed she was sleeping. Later, at 7.30 p.m., all three men rushed to her room concerned. They pulled back the covers to reveal something truly shocking. She had been beaten about the head. She had lost a critical amount of blood. She appeared to be at death's door. The attacker did not end with the cranial injury. A stainless steel medical implement known as a speculum, which features a clamp shaped like a bird's beak, had been rammed into her vagina. Terry Caldwell did not die that day. She was in a coma for 10 days and remained in hospital for more inpatient care for about a month. She survived. January 31st, 1974. Linda Ann Healy, 21, was a student at the University of Washington. She shared a house with four friends located close to the campus. Linda's bedroom was in the basement and separated from the bedroom of her friend Karen by only a plywood partition 
It was impossible not to be aware of what was happening beyond that wall, since anything that was audible was sure to bleed through that flimsy wall. Linda was in high spirits, looking forward to the future, enjoying time with her friends and boyfriend. Her family was due to visit the following day. Her roommate, Joanne Testa, said that there were no signs that Linda was uneasy or distressed. Everything was right in her world. She did mention something about something odd she observed, a shadow that moved outside. She didn't consider it to be a threat or a sign that her safety was at risk. She put it out of her mind. The front door of the house was accidentally left unlocked, as it often was. 5.30 a.m. Karen was woken by Linda's alarm clock. She stayed in bed until hers woke her up at 6 o'clock. Karen wondered why Linda still hadn't gotten up. The business Linda worked for, Northwest Ski Promotions, called and asked why Linda wasn't there. Karen called on her, but there was no response. Karen went to her room. Not only was the radio still on, but her bed was made. No wrinkles, and the spread was tucked under the pillow. It was not how Linda made her bed. In fact, she usually didn't make her bed in the morning. Karen bellowed upstairs, asking all who were present if they knew of Linda's whereabouts. Nobody knew. Around 4 p.m., Joanne called people who were in regular contact with Linda. None of them had seen her that day. Not at work not at school. 6 p.m. Linda's father James and her brother Robert showed up at the house. They were informed by Linda's roommates, who were very anxious by this point, that Linda was missing since the early morning hours and nobody they knew had seen her. James called his wife and she contacted the authorities. Officers arrived. They questioned all who were present, asking about Linda and the events as they unfolded. They were told that some of her clothes and a pair of boots were missing from her room. A red backpack with gray straps had also been taken. 8 p.m. The phone rang. Linda's roommate Monica answered it. She said hello. Dead air. She could tell someone was on the other end, but they wouldn't say a word. Faint but unmistakable was the sound of somebody breathing. The house received two other calls like this, and the caller was always silent. On the cusp of midnight, a homicide detective turned up at the house to inspect the scene. He went to Linda's room, followed by Joanne Testa. Joanne recounts what happened next. I was there when the policeman pulled back the spread for the first time. I saw that the pillowcase was gone and that there were blood stains on the pillow, as well as one fairly large blood stain on the sheet near the pillow. Linda owned two pink satin pillowcases and Joanne mentioned that detail to the detective, saying, As far as I know, Linda always kept a pillowcase on her pillow. The detective opened Linda's closet. A nightgown hung. There was a blood stain at the rear where the fabric reached the neck. Linda's housemates were hysterical and could no longer remain at the house, fearing that any or all of them could be next. In fall of 1973, 19-year-old Donna Manson was enrolled at Evergreen State College. At the time, detectives would have classified Donna Manson as a high-risk candidate for a target of violent crime. She hitchhiked, not just locally, but on long trips, which sometimes took her out of state. She liked to stay out all night. She would leave the area without notifying anybody first. She was affiliated with drug users and, by default, other criminal associates. March 12, 1974, 
Donna had plans to attend a jazz concert held on campus. She departed at 7 p.m. Megan Ellis, a friend, became aware of Donna's absence, but did not fret at first, knowing how Donna lived. A week later, Donna had still not returned. This was a different scenario entirely. Megan filed a missing persons report. That same day, campus security called Donna's parents, Lyle and Marie Manson. Lyle Manson, Gary Russell of campus security, and an unnamed individual searched Donna's dorm room. Nothing was out of the ordinary. There were no signs of foul play and no signs of evidence of any kind. The only conclusion they could come to was that she disappeared under strange circumstances. April 19th, 1974. Kathleen Clara Doliveau, 21, finished studying at the Bouillon Library, located at Central Washington State College. She was a student there. She was attractive with long, dark hair parted in the middle. She was walking down a sidewalk toward the parking lot where her car was situated. Before she got there, something attracted her attention. The sound of books hitting pavement. She recalled what happened next. I turned around and there was a man dropping books. He was squatting, trying to pick up the books and packages. I noticed that he had a sling on one arm and a metal hand brace on the other. I just noticed he was unable to pick up that many things, and I assumed that he was going into the library. Kathleen, eager to help, also approached the man with caution. She offered her assistance. The man said, yeah, could you? He appeared to be completely unthreatening, disabled without the use of his arms and struggling to hold on to packages while hauling a backpack full of books. Kathleen picked up the backpack. He shouldered the rest of the burden. She was unable to remember what he looked like after the fact. She continued with more details. I thought he was going to the library. He was headed that way, so I thought that's where he was going. But that same sidewalk actually leads up over a little bridge and away from the library. It's just a short bridge that goes over a man-made pond and the sidewalk will angle off to go into the library. Instead, the disabled man began walking across the bridge. Kathleen interpreted this as a red flag. She said to him, wait a minute, where are we going? The man said, oh, my car's just parked right over there. And he motioned to a location nearby. She considered the heavy weight of the backpack. If he tried anything, she could weaponize it and escape. As she explained, I was extremely cautious while with him. I never gave him the opportunity of walking behind me. His car was parked in a secluded area that was very dimly lit. To the casual bystander, any activity going on in that spot might not have been easy to discern. As they headed there, the man complained of pain that was symptomatic of a skiing accident. Though guarded, Kathleen saw no reason to doubt him. She remembered his car as being a Volkswagen Beetle, though she later had trouble remembering the color. There was almost no light on this section of the road. He led her to the passenger side of the vehicle. He struggled to fish out the key to the car. Kathleen put the backpack on the ground. She stepped back and said goodbye. She had helped him, and now it was time to leave. He asked her for one more favor. He dropped the key. He felt around for it. He asked her, Do you think you could find it for me? Because I can't feel with this thing on my hand. He remained in position, hovering over her. She was wary of this. She said, Let's step back and see if we can see the reflection in the light. She recounted what went on from there. So we stepped back behind the car, kind of behind the car to the side, and I squatted down and luckily I did see the reflection of the key in the light. She picked up the keys and dropped them into his hand. She wished him a rapid recovery from his injuries and rushed off. She said she believed he said thank you. 
That same day, Susan Elaine Rancourt, 18 years old, was an attractive blonde with long hair parted in the middle. Just before 8 p.m., she deposited her laundry in her dorm's laundromat. She went from there to Munson Hall, where she was to attend a meeting for students wishing to be dorm counselors. The meeting was scheduled to end at 10 o'clock. She was last seen walking with a man who was wearing a green ski parka. He appeared to be in a daze. April 18th, 5 p.m. Susan's roommate filed a missing persons report with the campus police. Susan's room was examined. Nothing appeared to be out of place, and there were no indications of foul play. An investigation began immediately after. Jane Curtis, 21 years old, had her own encounter with the injured man. After working in the library, she left at some point between 8.30 and 9 p.m. She tells the story of what happened next in her own words. After I finished work, I walked out the main entrance of the library and was just minding my own business. And there was this guy coming along, and he had this huge stack of books, like eight or nine books, all hardbound. And he had a cast on his left arm. And all of a sudden, he just kind of drops them right in the direction I was walking. So I just more or less offered assistance. She recalls the cast wasn't made of plaster. Gauze had been wrapped around his arm in layers. A metal splint, haphazardly affixed, was on his right hand. His outfit was not as Kathleen Dolival described. Curtis said he was wearing a grubby coat and a woolen hat with a brim that went up. Jane's assumption was that he was going to the parking lot used by students. He didn't stop there. He walked toward the railroad trestle with intention to carry on further beyond that point. As they walked, he told Jane he was injured while skiing on Crystal Mountain, where he ran into a tree. She had her doubts. She had skied there and couldn't foresee such an accident as being within the realm of possibility. She would later say, he didn't look like the skier type to me. As they walked, he kept to her left. At one point, he turned to her, and Jane was unnerved by what happened, as she recalls. He kind of turned his head and looked at me kind of funny-like. He looked at me strangely. His eyes seemed weird. They drew closer to his Volkswagen Beetle, whereupon he began to complain of pain. Jane walked up to the passenger side of the car. She carried most of the books. He carried two. He said, open it up, and handed her the keys. She withdrew her aid at this point. He was persistent. He said, get in. She said, what? Being ordered around by him under the circumstances struck her as extremely odd. He realized he handled it wrong and more diplomatically said, Oh, could you get in and start the car for me? Jane refused. He opened it himself. After opening the door, Jane was disturbed by the interior of the car, as she later recalled. When I looked, what really got me was that the passenger seat was gone. That's what really bothered me. It was gone. Jane knew something was afoot, and she was scared. She dropped the books on the ground by his feet. He just stood there for a moment, staring at her. Jane ran away. A missing persons poster was disseminated throughout the surrounding area of Oregon State University. Pictured was a female named Roberta Kathleen Parks. She was 21 years old at the time of her disappearance, and had waist-length hair parted in the middle. Kathy was a troubled girl and would sometimes draw comfort from solitude. This frequently took the form of nighttime walks, which she typically took between 9.30 p.m. and 11 p.m. A friend often offered her companionship for these walks, but withdrawal from social contact was sometimes therapeutic for Kathy. On the evening of May 6th, at 10.55, 
Kathy and her roommate Miriam Joan Schmidt made plans to visit friends who were also students. Just as Miriam came to collect Kathy, Kathy said, Go ahead, and I'll be over in a while. Fifteen minutes later, Miriam returned to the room and found that Kathy was not there. Another friend, Lorraine Fargo, observed Kathy walking just after 11 o'clock. As Lorraine tells it, she appeared to be in a daze and in a dream. Brenda Carol Ball was 22 years old and had dark colored long hair parted in the middle. She had one thing in common with Donna Manson. She would have been classified by law enforcement authorities as a high risk candidate for victimhood. Easy prey for violent offenders. May 31st, 1974. She spent the bulk of the evening at the Flame Tavern in the township of Burien, Washington, south of Seattle. The patrons of the Flame were a tough crowd. Disagreements frequently turned physical. Drunkards threw fists around and occasionally something worse. Brenda didn't feel unsafe there. Some of the regulars were friends of hers. She would stay quite late if she were enjoying herself. On this night, she left at closing time, 2 a.m. Accounts of her departure differ in description, and none can be verified with evidence. The only thing anybody could confirm was that she never made it home the morning of June 1st. She was a known hitchhiker who sometimes led a chaotic life, so her closest associates didn't report her missing until June 17th. Rewind. <laughs> Early in the evening of May 31st, Ted Bundy was with his girlfriend, Liz Kendall, her daughter, Tina, and her parents. They were visiting. They went for dinner and returned around 10 o'clock. It was about this time when Liz noticed something odd about Ted's behavior. She later said that he seemed anxious to leave. George Ann Hawkins, 18 years old, was attractive popular, and had long, dark hair parted in the middle. It was June 10th, 1974, and she went to a frat party with friends. George Ann was not comfortable walking alone at night. She adhered to the buddy system, preferring to walk with at least one other person. She and her friend Jennifer Roberts left the party at 12.30 a.m. Before returning to her room, she stopped to visit her boyfriend. Jennifer went home. George Ann wasn't wearing either her glasses or contacts. She yelled to Jennifer, asking her to tell her everything was okay. Jennifer did. George Ann told her likewise, and it was the last time Jennifer saw George Ann Hawkins. George Ann visited her boyfriend for a half hour. She left around 1 a.m. A friend named Dwayne, who lived in her boyfriend's frat house, initiated a conversation before she left. They stood in an alley next to the building. At one point, they heard someone laughing in the alley. After George Ann departed, she happened upon a disabled man who was carrying a briefcase. She assumed from his disability and struggled to walk with the briefcase in hand that he must be harmless. George Ann was a kind, empathetic sort. So when the man asked for help with his briefcase, she didn't hesitate for a second. In her mind, this was the right thing to do. As they arrived where his car was parked, he directed her from behind to the passenger door. Though it is unclear what steps were taken to facilitate the man's next action, it is known that he reached underneath the rear of his car and withdrew a crowbar. With a complete lack of knowledge of what was coming, he cracked her in the skull. She was rendered unconscious instantaneously. He hit her so hard, her earrings flew out. When she fell, her foot was dislodged from its shoe. He handcuffed her and threw her into his Volkswagen Beetle. There were no witnesses. He drove them down the alleyway. His victim was still unconscious. He took her to a rural area, as he described in a confession years later. We went across the bridge, across Mercer Island, east past Asequa, 
up the hill, down the road, and up to the grassy area. George Ann died soon after they arrived. Her executioner did not draw a line at death. He embraced her corpse and stripped it of all clothing. In his mind, they were now a couple. It was a necrophiliac romance. He copulated with her corpse for hours. As he saw it, it was the only circumstance under which he could pursue his ideal vision of a relationship with her without her consent. He could control the emotional and physical agenda, and that was exactly the way he wanted it. At some point, he was physically spent, but the relationship did not end there. July 14th, 1974. It was a hot and sunny summer day at Lake Sammamish State Park, and the beach was crowded. In fact, an estimated 40,000 people occupied the spot. Aside from assorted sun worshippers, there was also a large gathering of police officers for a picnic. That day would not be remembered for barbecues, picnics, and swimming. It is remembered in the annals of crime as the occasion when Janice Ann Ott, 23 years old, disappeared. Somehow this was possible amid the overcrowding of the beach. She settled down on the beach to get a suntan. About this time, a man was observed looking at the girls. He walked as he did so, sometimes stopping. He was sizing them up. It wasn't considered suspicious, since beaches in summer are meat markets for singles. The man kept walking. He didn't know that he passed an agent of the DEA as he did so. The man spotted Janice Ott. He was pleased with what he saw and made his move. He walked up to her. The DEA agent heard him greet her. Janice was apparently taken with the man as she invited him to sit next to her on her blanket. His arm was bandaged and in a sling, so he had to lower himself carefully. Once he was seated, he crossed his legs and chatted with Janice for about five minutes. Throughout the conversation, Janice gathered up her possessions. DEA agent Jerry Snyder later described the man as being between 5'10 and 5'11 inches tall. He looked to be between 25 and 29. He wore white boxer style shorts and a pullover beige colored shirt. His hair was collar length, wavy and sort of a light brown color. Teresa Marie Sharp sat close enough to Janice Ott to overhear her conversation with the man. She recounts the discussion. A guy came walking up to her. He said something about a sailboat. It sounded like, will you help me with my boat? Or would you like to ride in my boat? The girl sort of hesitated, but then said, can I bring my bike with me? He said, sure, okay. She thought the boat was at the lake, and he said no. It was at his parents' house. She looked like she wasn't going. I couldn't hear what was said then, but then I heard her say, under one stipulation, that I meet your parents. He said, sure. Then she said, I don't know how to sail. He said, that's okay. It will be easy to teach you. She asked him if there was room in the car for the bike. He said, it will fit in the trunk. She got up, slipped her blue jeans and her top on, and then she picked up her beach bag. The two of them then left. Other women were approached by him at the beach with a similar request to help him with a sailboat. Teresa said there was something not quite right about the sling on his arm. I didn't feel his arm was really hurt. I do remember he took his arm from the sling and moved it around. The man introduced himself to Janice, telling her his name was Ted. She found him handsome and articulate. They talked as they walked through the large crowd toward the parking lot. Janice got in the passenger door of his Volkswagen Beetle, and they were off. It was a brief commute. They made small talk along the way. There was nothing about the situation that came across as suspicious to Janice. Ted would later refer to this as reinforcing the ruse. Another day, he went to Lake Sammamish Park and used the same ruse 
on Denise Nasland, 18 years old. She was a pretty girl with long, dark hair parted in the middle. She was last seen speaking to a man with a sling on his arm. She was high on Valium, marijuana, and beer. Because of this, she was suggestible. Her friend Robin Woods confirmed this. If she was high on July 14, 1974, she would be loose, meaning relaxed. If the guy was a smooth talker and good-looking, Denise would then help him. She was never seen again. There was renewed pressure on law enforcement to make an arrest. The air and ground was searched with no results. Scuba divers searched the deepest bodies of water in the area, but found no cadavers. Police were stunned that not only had the culprit gotten away with the abduction, but he pulled it off in broad daylight adjacent to large crowds with an enormous police presence. This was bold. No clues, no evidence. They were helpless to intervene as the suspects sought more prey. They gathered together en masse to pool their collective resources. At one point, there was a conference of 30 police departments. They weren't at a complete loss for clues. The girls who were approached by the seemingly disabled man who requested their assistance with a boat had his name and gave it to the police, Ted. They also recalled that he had drove a Volkswagen Beetle whose color was light brown or tan. Though there was a possibility that Ted was an alias, they couldn't afford to ignore that data. The police asked the public to come forward with information if they encountered the suspect or knew who he was. They also requested copies of any photos that may have been taken at Lake Sammamish Park the days of the girls' disappearances. The investigation would draw upon an enormous amount of resources as the perpetrator eluded capture. Ted was aware that he was being hunted. He read every newspaper article about the case. He absorbed all information the police had at their disposal. Despite his reckless disclosure of his real name at the beach, they came nowhere near catching him. Unlike many serial killers, he changed locations constantly. The police hadn't even found the bodies. The exact number of victims he killed in the state of Washington is unknown. Estimates have it at 11, but that is pure speculation. It was also in the summer of 1974 that Carol Valenzuela was killed soon after hitchhiking on August 2nd. Unlike many of his other victims, her body was found. It was located in a rural area of Clark County. A hundred feet from where she lay was another female victim. She was not identified. They both had long hair parted in the middle. They were both placed in shallow graves beside large logs. Investigators believed that their bodies had been in the ground a month before Carol's. Ted Bundy was born Theodore Robert Cowell on November 24, 1946 in Burlington, Vermont. He was conceived by his mother, Louise Cowell, and a sailor. The sailor's identity has never been confirmed. The sailor abandoned Louise and she was left to fend for herself. Given American society's mores at the time, becoming pregnant out of wedlock was considered shameful. She gave birth at the Elizabeth Lund home for unwed mothers. Theodore was a healthy and happy baby, and because everything seemed to be right with him, it was time for her to leave the home. She returned to her home city of Philadelphia, where she moved back in with her family, that being her mother, father, and sisters. They welcomed her and her son into their lives. The Cowell household was dysfunctional. For one thing, Ted was led to believe that his grandparents were his parents. His mother was presented as a much older sister. This was done to conceal the illegitimate conception of Ted from outsiders. This wasn't the worst of their problems. His grandfather, Samuel, was mentally ill and violent. He had been physically abusive to his children. Once, when one of his daughters slept late, he punished her by throwing her down the stairs. He tortured animals. He collected pornography, which Ted later discovered. 
Samuel would frequently engage in a conversation with an unseen presence, figures straight out of a hallucination. Despite all this, Ted remembered him fondly, describing him only as a highly educated and loving grandfather. Louise's sisters recalled some disturbing behavior by Ted. One of them said she was awakened by Ted one day when he was about three years old. She was taking a nap, and he had placed kitchen knives under the blanket and around her body. He said and did nothing other than stand there with a dazed expression on his face. They recalled that Ted had a sinister alter ego he would morph into from time to time. His conduct as the alter ego was unsettling for them. To quote one of his aunts, Ted had had episodes where he would seem to turn into another unrecognizable person. A great aunt who had witnessed one such episode suddenly, inexplicably, found herself afraid of her favorite nephew as they waited together at a dusk-darkened train station. On October 6, 1949, Ted's surname was changed from Cowell to Nelson. His mother moved with Ted to Browns Point, Washington, to live with her uncle Jack Cowell. She knew that if people noticed that Ted's surname was the same as his uncle's, they would put two and two together and realize he was conceived illegitimately. The same year, Louise met a war veteran by the name of John Bundy. Love followed shortly thereafter, and they married the same year. John adopted Ted with a name change to follow. John and Louise had children together, a girl, Linda, and two boys, Richard and Glenn. Ted came to love his stepfather, but he did not respect him. John was not a very cerebral man, and Ted would spar with him intellectually. He did this to press his buttons. John even tried to punch Ted because of one of these attacks. John was the disciplinarian and there were frequent clashes between them. Bundy finally discovered the truth about his conception. Though it is not confirmed how he learned of this, there is one story involving his cousin John. John told Ted and ridiculed him for it. Ted didn't buy it, but John told him he knew where his birth certificate was, and he showed him. This was deeply humiliating to Ted, and spoilage in his psyche would grow into bitterness. Another story is that he discovered the birth certificate on his own. He saw it as an opportunity to make a decision about who I was. He took an optimistic view for the time being, thankful as he was for all the love he received from his family. The optimism was short-lived. Nothing anybody could say could comfort or reassure him when it came to the sensitive issue of his birth. This anger would leave an ulcer on his soul an indication of how much the abandonment of Ted by his biological father affected him can be found in a quote from his 1976 pre-sentence investigation report. It is of interest that the defendant displayed marked signs of hostility when asked about his early childhood, specifically when he was asked about his real father's whereabouts. His face became quite contorted and reddened, and he paused momentarily. He then gained composure and replied rather succinctly and said, Approximately, you might say that he left my mother and me and never rejoined the family. Throughout his school years, the only aberrant behavior on Ted's part happened at Hunt Junior High. He would occasionally masturbate in the broom closet of his classroom. Some of the other boys became aware of this and caught him in the act on a few occasions. They tossed cold water on him, and he was subjected to relentless ridicule. Ted has denied this happened. In high school, Ted had a couple of close friends, but making new ones became very difficult for him. He felt like an interloper in society, and it amounted to a great deal of inner turmoil. While his peers were maturing at the expected pace, he felt he was falling behind. At some point, his emotional growth stopped completely. Years later, he confided to the people he knew best that he felt lost in high school. Ted was attractive to many women, and this was true in high school as well. He never dated, though. The girls wondered if he had a girlfriend elsewhere. 
He became more and more attractive to women as he physically matured into a man. To augment his physical appeal, he was articulate and charming. People in general liked him. Despite being so well received, he did not feel good about himself. He had imposter syndrome. The superlatives he heard about himself seemed to him to be more apropos when describing other men. His anger continued to grow. There were many humiliating incidents that chipped away at his self-esteem. In junior high, he ran for student body vice president, but lost. He assisted other candidates in high school, but never ran himself. Bundy excelled at sports, though he was rejected from the basketball team for being, quote, too small. He initially made pocket money by mowing lawns. He eventually became a petty thief. Money was tight in his family, and so his first foray into criminal activity involved stealing such things as skiing equipment. He also learned a technique to forge lift tickets. Ted graduated from Wilson High School in 1965. He enrolled at University of Puget Sound the same year without declaring a major. He continued to live at home. His need to bond with a female in an intimate relationship in the most conventional way possible would not be denied now. A psychologist noted years later that he, quote, had a longing for a beautiful co-ed, but didn't have the skill or social acumen to cope with it, unquote. In the absence of that skill and social acumen, he would conceal his inadequacies by adorning a mask of sanity. This behavior is common among psychopaths, according to experts on criminal behavior, whether violent or not. Most of the people who met and became acquainted with him for the next several years didn't realize they were mingling with a mirage. Such was his dedication to this facade that Dr. Al Carlisle, a clinical psychologist that evaluated Bundy, wrote, He lived his life in a compulsive manner that was well-ordered and exact. Events and actions, as well as conversations, were planned and rehearsed many times before they took place. It was very important for him to never be caught off his guard. Life was like a chess game to him. He was always mentally two moves ahead of his opponent. So no matter what move was made, he always had several suitable countering actions that could assure him success. A quote from the summary of Dr. Carlyle's report. I feel Mr. Bundy has not allowed me to get to know him, and I believe there are many significant things about him that remain hidden. Dr. Van O. Austin, a prison psychiatrist, summarized Bundy on these terms. It is my feeling that there is much more to his personality structure than either the psychologist or I have been able to determine. However, as long as he compartmentalizes, rationalizes, and debates every facet of his life, I do not feel that I adequately know him, and until I do, I cannot predict his future behavior. Ted did not enjoy his freshman year in university. Though he socialized with his old friends Warren Dodge and Terry Storwick, he never met the co-ed of his dreams. On a personal level, his life was almost identical to the way it was in high school. He enrolled for the fall semester at the University of Washington's Seattle campus. He decided on Asian history and language. His long-range goal at this juncture was to work for the State Department, quote, in an academic position, such as in trade on mainland China, unquote. Bundy said he, quote, wanted to gain a position of authority to improve the relationships between the United States and China, unquote. It was there where he met the co-ed of his dreams. She would become known by a pseudonym, that being Carla Browning. She was beautiful, refined, and from a prestigious family in San Francisco. He was proud to have her as his girlfriend, but pessimistic about the long-range prospects. He assumed she wouldn't share her future with someone she didn't view as her equal, taking his background into consideration. He presumed that if she ever got a glimpse of any weakness 
immaturity, or failure, she would run to the hills. He placed an enormous amount of pressure on himself to measure up. He relied on the mask of sanity to keep his insecurities hidden. Eventually, the relationship was plagued by what he referred to as, quote, petty matters. One such matter was his habit of using her money from time to time, both as cash and credit. Carla was troubled by other problems, like his declining academic performance. In 1967, Ted attended classes at the Chinese Institute at Stanford University on scholarship. The purpose was to continue in his Asian studies and to be closer to Carla. His academic performance was poor and he lost interest in having a career dealing with Asian dignitaries. There were other sources of his discontent. He didn't enjoy university life. He missed Washington and everything associated with his home. Years later, he intimated that he felt, quote, a bit too alien at Stanford. In fall of that year, he returned to the University of Washington. This time, he intended to major in architecture and urban planning. He supported himself by parking cars at the Seattle Yacht Club. All the stress he felt on a personal level affected his academic performance. His feeling of being alienated and lonely was compounded when Carla broke up with him. He began to unravel psychologically, and he was desperate for a way to relieve himself of the pressure. He explained it to a cousin by saying he had a need, quote, to get out of Seattle because there were bad remembrances. He chose not to return for the winter semester of 1968. He needed to take time out to regroup. His next step was to leave the state entirely. He visited relatives across the country until he returned to Washington. Ted spent the rest of winter and spring 1968 working menial jobs. His future took an unexpected and far more prosperous detour due to a chance meeting with an old friend. They offered Ted the opportunity to work for Art Fletcher, a city councilman who was seeking the Republican nomination for lieutenant governor. He had no better options, so he accepted the job. With a mask of sanity, he conformed to the party's standards successfully and would eventually be groomed for loftier positions. Though Art Fletcher didn't win, Ted became passionate about political life, and he threw himself into it full force. He worked other jobs and maintained his facade of normalcy in both disposition and deed. This left him well-placed for an event that would have a seismic effect on his inner life. In September of 1969, he met a woman at the Sandpiper Tavern in the University District. She became known as Liz Kendall years later. Having imbibed enough alcohol, he felt confident enough to approach her. He asked her to dance. She turned him down. Seconds later, he took to the dance floor with somebody else. Having regretted her decision, she approached him later when he was sitting alone. He lied about his life and background, and Liz reacted with a healthy amount of skepticism, but she was so taken in by his charm and looks that she was not dissuaded by his claims. They drove back to her place that night, and Ted slept over. They slept together. Nothing sexual happened. They slept adjacent to each other, fully clothed. He wanted to have a normal romantic relationship with a woman, and Liz escorted him to that level of emotional intimacy. They became committed to each other, and this consolidated his image as a normal person, conforming in just about every way. They discussed marriage, but made no solid plans. Though he had his own apartment, he spent so much time at hers they were practically living together. She felt that if they got married, it would justify her helping him pay for law school. The problem was, he wasn't ready for law school. He was still two years away from an undergraduate degree. Though she was upset that he lied to her, she still believed in him and felt confident that he would one day be called to the bar. She was determined to bring those dreams into reality. There was no doubt in her mind that Ted would deliver. May 1970. Bundy was fired from a job at a company called Legal Messengers Incorporated. He began summer classes at the university in June. 
he continued to work menial jobs to pay the bills. One such job was as a delivery driver for Pedline Medical Supplies. He stole many of the kind of items he delivered, such as plaster of Paris for making casts, crutches, and a speculum. By this juncture, Ted was a seasoned peeping Tom. Two Ted Bundys would emerge over the next four years. The one he presented to the world for the first four years was a university student, fiancé, and confident, gregarious young man who endeared himself to professors and students alike. He was motivated and anxious to please and achieve. What Liz and all those other people who knew him during the first four years didn't know was that a cold-blooded murderer and sex offender was incubating and ready to be born during January 1974 when he murdered Terry Caldwell. It was then when the son of perdition took his first steps and cut a path of terror straight up to a long line of females who were unfortunate enough to find themselves within his sights. Unbeknownst to Liz, he began seeing Carla again in San Francisco. She was impressed by this new Ted Bundy. He was doing well in school and was determined to make something of himself. Not long after their reunion, he asked her to marry him. She said yes without hesitation. He returned to Seattle triumphant. He had no intentions of marrying her. He just wanted to pay her back for dumping him. It was revenge. The problem was she wasn't the only woman who would pay for what she had done to him. He would seek others and the blueprints for the traps he would set for them were drafted over those four years. In the meantime, he took a position in September 1971 at the Seattle Crisis Clinic as a telephone counselor. He was known to be very effective at dealing with people who were severely distraught. He even prevented more than one suicide. Oddly, he felt close to women who were abused or abandoned by their husbands. In June 1972, a psychology major, he graduated from the University of Washington. He accepted a position with the Harborview Mental Health Center as a counselor, though this time it was in person. Not all his performance reviews were positive. One member of the staff noted that Bundy was, quote, not capable of being emotionally responsive to the needs of his clients and patients. Liz remained loyal to Ted, even when he lied or stole. Cheating, that was something else entirely. She not only loved Ted, but was helping to support him financially, and she felt deeply betrayed. Still, the thought of losing him was even more painful, so she stayed with him. Ted volunteered for another Republican candidate, incumbent Governor Dan Evans. It was a volunteer position, but Ted was up to the job. It was his task to spy on the opposition. He even wore disguises. Altering his appearance and stalking people would become a specialty skill for Ted Bundy, and on this occasion, he practiced it to good effect. Ted began to behave in ways that caught Liz's attention, and not for good reasons. He did things that struck her as bizarre. One night, he left her place late, but soon after returned to retrieve something from the front porch. Liz heard him out there, and when she opened the door, Bunny looked back at her, shocked. The way Liz described it, he stood there looking really sick, like he was hiding something. She saw him put something in his pocket. She asked him what it was, but he refused to tell her. She took the situation into her own hands. She put her hand inside his pocket and pulled out a pair of surgical gloves. He immediately grabbed them back from her and rushed away from the house apparently in a hurry to be wherever he was headed. She still didn't know about the hideous fantasies he entertained. They were fantasies that exceeded murder in their potential to shock and appall. Detective Robert Keppel interviewed Ted Bundy extensively. He described how macabre Ted's fantasies had become. Ted readily admitted that he was preoccupied with a cyanotic hue of a corpse's fingernails discoloration of the skin after death, necrophilia, and possession of the female corpse. 
Bundy applied to several law schools, but his dismal score on the law school aptitude test but his dismal score on the law school aptitude test put the kibosh on any hopes he had at that point of becoming an attorney. With a letter of recommendation from the governor of Washington, he was accepted into the University of Utah for the school year of 1973 to 1974. He would wait another year before beginning his studies there. In the meantime, he worked temporarily for the Seattle Crime Commission. He continued to benefit from his connections to figures of prestige, and he was hired as assistant director. His superior gave this description of Ted. Ted was well-behaved, well-dressed, intelligent, and acted extremely proper at all times. He was an aggressive, hard-nosed individual who was competent, hard-working, a good writer, and extremely valuable in his public relation functions and always did his job well and on time. He was still fooling them. Among his many duties was to report about sexual assaults against women. This position drew Bundy's interest more than any other. He would find out how the attacks were committed, the ratio of arrests to convictions, and how police and sheriff's departments were collaborating to stamp out the problem. It was on-the-job training for the avocation for which he would become famous. Toward the end of 1973, Bundy accepted a position with the King County Law and Justice Planning Office. He worked there until April, though its official task was to examine the recidivism rate of female sexual offenders. He spent every available moment in the office researching how law enforcement handled missing girls cases. Like a chess player, he wouldn't make a move before knowing the angle from which his opponent would strike. He committed to memory every aspect of investigative procedure germane to sex crimes against females. The monster within him was famished, and the first casualty of its thirst for blood was the Ted Bundy known to outsiders. His three-piece suits were costumes. His ingratiating gestures and words were drawn from a carefully rehearsed script. That Ted Bundy was a character played by an actor with a gift for improvisation. The real Ted Bundy was tearing itself free from its straitjacket. 1974 was the year of its birth. Ted attended school during the winter semester. He intended to withdraw before the end of the year. Those who knew him well often referred to him as the Phantom. He would occasionally disappear, and sometimes for days, and then all of a sudden he was back in class. When he finally dropped out, he told Liz he couldn't concentrate but didn't know why. The truth was, his killing spree had begun, and it consumed his thoughts day and night, inside class and out. He also neglected his activities within the Republican Party and his own political prospects fell by the wayside. Liz began to notice changes in his personality. For instance, his sexual proclivity suddenly changed in a way she didn't expect. He wanted to have anal sex with her. She refused. She let him tie her up during sex, but she soon put an end to that. Sexually speaking, they were just not on the same page anymore. Eventually, he stopped approaching her for sex completely. During a rafting trip, he pushed her out of the raft, and she nearly drowned. She recalled what she saw when she looked back at him. His face had gone blank. I had the sense that he wasn't seeing me. I could find no expression on his face. Liz was outraged and conveyed this to him. He downplayed it. The following Saturday night, he was at his parents' house when Liz called him. She asked him if he was game for doing something the next day. He said no, that he had other things to do. When she probed, he said, just things, Liz. The next day, Thursday, he called in sick. He also missed work on Friday and then again on Monday and Tuesday. Early on Sunday, Ted stopped by Liz's place to see what she was up to for the day. She said she would take her daughter to church and then sunbathe at the beach. Ted asked her which beach it would be. She interpreted it as meaning he would be joining her there, 
but he never showed. He turned up later, offering to take her and her daughter Tina out for dinner. He was starving and exhausted. He told her he had been working on his car and doing yard work for his landlords. She tried to brush it off, but the report that the abductor from Lake Sammamish Park was a man named Ted, who resembled her fiancé and drove the same car, didn't sit well with her. She struggled with this for quite some time. A psychology professor from the University of Puget Sound called Detective Keppel and said, I have a weird guy in my class who drives a 1968 Volkswagen and who matches the composite drawing from your office. Someone anonymously made a call to Keppel's staff in July and gave them the license number and make of Ted's car. After three contacts were made to them concerning Theodore Robert Bundy, he was, to quote Keppel, put on a special list, quote, as one of your top 100 candidates for further investigation. Ted Bundy left for Utah to resume his studies in law school. On the way, on the outskirts of Boise, Idaho, he discovered a young woman hitchhiking at the top of a freeway on-ramp. He pulled over into the emergency lane and motioned for her to get in. To eliminate any fears in her mind that he was a sketchy character, he endeared her with the mask of sanity, and she accepted the masquerade on face value. They continued along the highway for the next four hours leading into night. At one point, when it was clear she was adequately distracted, he pulled a crowbar from underneath the passenger seat. He raised it up slowly to avoid attracting her attention. He brought it down in one fell swoop and pounded the right side of her skull. He inflicted an enormous amount of damage to her cranium, so much that she was knocked unconscious on impact. She was still alive, though, as he hoped she would be. He pulled the car over to the side of the road. He dragged her shaking body to a spot near a river. He removed all her clothes. He became aroused and fornicated with her unconscious body. He strangled her to death as he sodomized her. He dragged her body into the water. He threw her clothing in with her. The skeleton of Denise Nasland was found by a hunter. He found the skeleton with its skull detached. The skull laid on the ground nearby. A man who showed up to do some target shooting found a clump of her hair. It was two feet long. There wasn't much left of Naslin's body other than bones. Animal predation left her stripped of most of her flesh. They scattered her remains all over the place. Investigators enlisted the help of volunteers to comb the woods in search of human flesh and bone. ESAR, or Explorer Search and Rescue, searched every inch of the woods, which had been organized into grids. The search yielded fruit. Detective Keppel referred to that crime scene as a veritable cache of human remains. To quote Keppel, We literally unearthed a graveyard, a killer's lair, where he'd taken and secreted the bodies of his victims. The bodies of Janice Ott and George Ann Hawkins were found, but without their skulls. George Ann Hawkins' head was buried on the hillside. Her skull was never located. Bundy's grades were mediocre at law school, and his attendance was even worse. He was so obsessed with murder and its fringe benefits that he could barely concentrate on school. His previous murders were committed in Washington and were at the time perceived only as Washington's problem. It was about to become Utah's problem, too. October 2nd, 16-year-old Nancy Wilcox was blonde with her long hair parted in the middle. She disappeared and was last seen in a Volkswagen Beetle. Years later, Bundy described his approach to Wilcox. He saw her walking one night. Initially, he only wanted to rape her. He figured he could release the tensions within him that way and that killing her would not be necessary. He parked his car, took up his knife, and ran up behind her. He forced her off the sidewalk and into an orchard, which was very dark. He tried to remove her clothes, but she struggled. Bundy has said it seemed as though she didn't view him as a serious threat. 
She argued with him, and it got louder and louder. He put his hand over her mouth. She still made noise. He tried a different tack. He choked her. His intention wasn't to kill her. He only wanted her to pass out. She fell quiet, and he removed her clothes. He had sex with her while she was still passed out. When he left, he didn't know if she was alive or dead. Hours later, he returned to see if her body was still there. It was then that he knew she was dead. Her body had never been found by the authorities. October 18th. Melissa Smith was 17 years old with long, dark brown hair parted in the middle. After meeting with a friend at a pizza parlor, she called home and told her sister Jolene that she would be home around 10 o'clock. October 27th. Deer hunters discovered the dead body of a young white female. She was naked except for a beaded necklace. A man's sock was wrapped tightly around her neck. Around four o'clock, detectives arrived to survey the scene. Detective Ben Forbes describes the condition of the body in this excerpt from his report. The body is located on its stomach, with the left arm completely folded underneath the body and the right arm extended and unfolded at a 90 degree angle and both legs bent at the knees. Forbes went on to document data about heavy abrasions on the shoulders. They extended down the back. There were cuts and abrasions on the buttocks and legs. The latter injuries are typically incurred when bodies are dragged over rough terrain. There were signs of blunt force trauma to her head. In another section, he wrote, approximately six inches above the top vertebra is what appears to be a bullet wound of contact. This turned out to be inaccurate. Only the crowbar had been used to do the damage. Fear was an aphrodisiac for Ted Bundy. Seeing the terror in his victim's eyes was more effective than a flutter of her lashes. One thing that puzzled investigators about the condition of Melissa Smith's corpse. Bundy treated her like a human Barbie doll. He put makeup on her and washed her hair. She wasn't the only victim he did this with. As in Washington, citizens in Utah feared for the safety of its young women. A predator with trademarks and habits was on the loose. It was happening often enough that young women were forced to practice extra caution while en route. Laura Amy's parents were very concerned about her safety, given the troubling reports of missing and murdered young women. She was 17 years old and confident that she would never cross paths with such dangers. As she said to her mother, Oh, Mom, I can take care of myself. October 31st, Laura left a party around midnight and began hitchhiking with the intent to get to the city of Lehigh. Soon, someone picked her up. The driver made some small talk and they engaged in some pleasant conversation. That is all she was cognizant of before the crowbar hit her in the back of her head. The next day, her father became concerned when she didn't show up for a hunting expedition. November 8, 1974. Carol DeRanche was nearly murdered by Bundy. He approached her while impersonating a police officer. He tried to cuff her in his car, but she fought back and escaped. When she ran off, he was tempted to catch up to her, but he knew it would look too suspicious to onlookers, so he drove away. DeRanche would be the only woman to escape his clutches at a time when her life was on the line. She waved motorists Wilbur and Mary Walsh over to her and got in. She was panicking too much to regret the imposition. Still petrified, she said, I can't believe it. I can't believe it. A man. A man. He was going to kill me. Mary comforted her while Wilbur drove them to the police station. The same night, Bundy murdered Deborah Kent at Viewmont High School the night a play was presented in its auditorium. The consequences for her family were far-reaching, with alcoholism and divorce among the many consequences of Bundy's actions. To quote her father, Dean Kent, I certainly feel that he was the cancer that destroyed our family. November 27, 1974, 
A couple from Brigham Young University were hiking in American Fort Canyon. Whatever they expected to encounter in nature's domain, they didn't bargain on finding the corpse of Laura Ann Amy. Her body was naked. She was lying face down. A stocking was wrapped around her neck. Her tongue was protruding through her teeth. Her face was swollen. Her skull had been broken by one or more blows from a heavy object. Her father Jim was beyond devastated when he identified her body at the morgue. Those present remember an ear-splitting wail that burst out of him. One officer said, I couldn't believe it had come from a human being. Recalling his feelings on the matter years later, Jim said, My little baby was up there all by herself, and there was nothing I could do to help her. Bundy's crimes were now receiving media focus in Utah. On December 10th, 1974, the headline of the Deseret News read, Unsolved Crimes Cloak Bountiful in Fear. The township of Bountiful's police chief, Dean O. Anderson, confirmed this in the article. For years, I've been saying that Bountiful is a nice, safe place where you could walk the streets alone. Now I can't say that anymore. The term serial killer was not in circulation at the time, but the citizens of Utah knew they had a one-man killing machine at large, and the panic didn't leave any center of civilization neglected. Liz notified authorities in Utah that she felt Ted may be responsible for the murders that were under investigation. She noted that after he left Washington, the murders stopped. She also pointed out that they began in Utah as soon as he arrived there. She told them about the beetle and the crutches. She didn't give his name, feeling like she could be wrong. The detective persuaded her to give him his first name. She told him it was Ted. The name Ted had been given to him more than once. Karen Campbell was abducted by Bundy in January of 1975. It took place at a ski resort in Aspen, Colorado. Years later, he confessed to this killing and described how he did it. Just like the others, hitting her in the head just once. I did my thing right there in the car. February 17th, 1975. Karen Campbell's body was found in a rural area a long distance from the Wildwood Inn, where she and her family had been staying at the time of her abduction and murder. Her body was frozen solid. It was completely devoid of clothing. Dental records confirmed her identity. An autopsy was performed only after the body thawed, which took 24 hours. The cause of death was determined to be blows to the back of the head with a blunt object combined with exposure to sub-zero weather. One of her teeth had been broken, which was commensurate with one of the blows that was visited upon her head. Extensive damage had been done to the soft tissue sections of her face, head, and one of her arms. This was blamed on animal predation. Bite marks were found on her skull, and most of the bones of one of her arms were exposed. Bundy went back to law school and did well, despite his frequent absences. He had found a way to establish work-murder balance. March 1st, 1975. More remains were found. This time they were found at Taylor Mountain. The lower mandible of Linda Healy's skull was found. The cracked skull and lower mandible of Kathy Parks was located nearby. All her upper teeth had been removed. Investigators found the skull of Susan Rancourt. Blunt force trauma had been dealt to the back of her skull. Her mandible was broken in three places. She had been scalped. Her hair was found as a unit close by. Brenda Ball's skull was found. The lower mandible was missing. Part of the right side of her skull was missing. A medical examiner opined that this was not caused by an animal. March 15, 1975, Vail, Colorado, 9 p.m. Julie Cunningham, 26, left her apartment to meet a friend at a tavern. She was never seen by anyone who knew her again. Years later, Bundy himself told the story of her fate. I walked back toward the center of town, up the road, and I walked slowly, 
looking at the passers-by. Coming down the road towards me, she was alone and walking on the outside of the parked cars. I used the crutch and fumbled with the boots and started to cross the street, and I asked her to help. I told her that I needed a little help to get to my car. It was parked only a short distance down the road in the direction she was walking. She agreed to help him, and Bundy said he started with a little small talk about getting off work and hurting my legs skiing. He led Julie to the passenger side of his beetle. He asked her to assist him by putting the crutches in his car. When I opened the door and she bent over, I hit her in the head and pushed her into the car. She was unconscious, and as I drove away, I put handcuffs on her. He drove her to a rural area near a small lake. Ted describes what happened in the car on the way there, an event he didn't anticipate. She was unconscious for a short time, and when she came to, she was asking where she was. What was this all about? She implored him to spare her life. This only turned him on, and his sexual arousal was about to peak. He didn't kill her right away. He choked her until she passed out. He raped her while she was unconscious. He left the passenger door open and waited for her to awaken. When she came to, she leapt from the car and ran for a short distance toward the road. She screamed all the way, but there was nobody but Bundy to hear her. He caught up with her and strangled her to death. He pulled her body under a juniper tree and stripped it of all clothing. He took her clothing and other personal effects and left. He took the items and deposited them into a dumpster down the road. Bundy returned to her body twice. He buried it the second time. April 6, 1975. Denise Oliverson, 24 years old, had long brown hair parted in the middle. Details about this murder are scant. He killed her quickly and dumped her remains in the Colorado River. Her body was never found. May 5th, 1975. Ted Bundy was on the prowl. He was bloodthirsty and eager to find another young woman to violate and murder. Ted Bundy was questioned by law enforcement about why he went to the town of Pocatello, Idaho that day. This is from a transcript of that dialogue between Russell Renault, chief investigator for the Idaho Attorney General's office, and Bundy. Renault, do you recall why you were in Pocatello at that particular time? Bundy, yes. Renault, can you tell me? Bundy, oh yes. Oh, excuse me. Oh, madness. What can I say? It was basically to do what was done. Bundy did confess to abducting 12-year-old Lynette Culver. Bundy lured her into his car with his charm, and they exchanged many pleasantries. He brought her to his Holiday Inn hotel room. He drowned her in the bathtub. Once she was dead, Bundy indulged his necrophiliac urges. Afterwards, he dumped her body miles away into a river. June 27, 1975. 15-year-old Susan Curtis had long, light brown hair parted in the middle. On the evening of this date, she attended a banquet for the Bountiful Orchard Youth Conference on the campus of Brigham Young University in Provo, Utah. At one point, she left the banquet hall to go to her room across the campus to brush her teeth. The story of how Bundy apprehended and assaulted her exists in the minds of outside parties only in the realm of speculation. July 1st, 1975, Shelley Robertson disappeared, and nobody in her family had a clue where she went. Calls were made all the way to the outer web of her social network, but nobody knew of her whereabouts. August 23rd, 1975, two students were exploring an old mine shaft near Berthoud Pass when they found a dead body. It was a female. She was nude. She was bound with duct tape. At the time of its discovery, it was at an advanced stage of decomposition. August 15, 1975. Estimates vary as to an exact figure, but investigators speculate that Bundy had killed at least 22 women by this date. Due to his meticulous planning and execution, he hadn't been caught. 
He had even been so bold as to keep the decapitated heads of four of his victims in a room he rented. He was pulled over by a police officer on this date. The fact that he tried to outrun the officer and even ran two red lights didn't do anything to alleviate suspicion. The officer ordered Bundy to stand next to his vehicle as he searched it. He looked through the car with a flashlight. One thing that caught his attention was that the passenger seat had been detached and lied on the back seat. Where the passenger seat would normally be sat a brown gym bag. The bag was open. The contents were detailed in a report written by deputy in the arrest report. One nylon white rope approximately seven inches in length. One tan with dark brown stripe ski mask. One brown cotton glove with a leather hand grip. One Sears model 6577 pry bar. One black leather ski glove. One pair of pantyhose with eye and nose holes cut out. One box of Glad trash bags. One Ever Ready Captain's brand flashlight. One piece of orange wire, four inches in length. One ice pick with a red handle. Eight strips of white sheet material cloth, different lengths. A pair of handcuffs were found in the trunk. Three more officers arrived on the scene. Captain Pete Hayward was the officer who pulled him over, and it was he who informed Bundy of the criteria he met as a criminal offender, which he articulated to him by saying, I'm going to arrest you tonight for evading an officer, Mr. Bundy, but I intend to ask the county attorney for a complaint against you for possession of burglary tools. Bundy was taken to jail, booked, photographed, and released on his own recognizance. His murder kit was admitted into evidence and locked away. A large conglomerate of departments from Salt Lake City and surrounding townships met to discuss the murders. One of the investigators who dealt with Ted Bundy, Detective Daryl Ondrak, said this about Bundy. There's something more here. I thought for a while Bundy was an armed robber, but we didn't find a weapon. He's not just your ordinary prowler. Some of the stuff we found in his car is obviously for tying someone up. I don't know. Bundy is the strangest man I ever met. Another detective asked Ondrak to elaborate on what he meant by strange. Ondrak said, I used to be in the Marine Corps. You meet a lot of strange people in the Corps. I don't know. It's just a gut reaction. This man's into something big. They contacted police in Seattle, and it was then that both agencies realized they just might have their man. He moved up to the top of the suspect list of the spree killer they were looking for. August 21st, Ted Bundy was served with an arrest warrant at his home by Detective Ondrak. It was the second time he was taken to jail that week. Nothing in Ondrak's experience as an investigator prepared him for Bundy's mask of sanity. It was fastened in place by the reality distortion field. And like many others, Ondrak was puzzled that someone who seemed so normal and conforming could be responsible for the diabolical crimes of which he was suspected. Bundy was booked once again, though he was led to believe that he was only suspected of committing burglary. It soon became clear that he was brought in for something else entirely. He was interrogated by Ben Forbes. Bundy waived his right to have an attorney present. He should have known better, having been a law student, but his motive was motivated more of arrogance than stupidity. He didn't think much of cops, whether individually or as a unit. Ted enjoyed sparring with the detective anyway. He blundered along the way, forgetting which lies he told. He was also inconsistent with details. Still, he was very sure of himself. Forbes suddenly blurted out, My game is homicide. He made another effort to rattle Bundy when he informed him he was a suspect in an attempted kidnapping murder case. Bundy said nothing. Forbes asked him to sign a consent form so officers could search his apartment. Ted signed it. Officers drove Bundy back to his apartment. The items they found that struck them as possibly incriminating 
were a book called The Joy of Sex, a roadmap of Colorado, a Colorado ski country guide for 1974-1975, a brochure by the Bountiful Recreation Center, a copy of a Chevron gas station bill written out to Theodore R. Bundy, a copy of a phone bill for the month of June. It included a call made to Denver, Colorado. This, after Bundy told one detective he had never been to Colorado and didn't have any friends there. The detective asked Bundy if he could keep these items, and Bundy said yes. Bundy said he had never been to Colorado, but had a friend who had been there. The detective didn't believe him. Ted allowed his car to be photographed. Once the detectives were finished in his apartment, they took him back to the station. August 22, 1975. Ted Bundy enlisted an attorney by the name of John O'Connell. He advised Bundy not to speak with police any further. Bundy abstained from doing so. September 1st. Carol Deranche, the one abductee who had managed to escape from Ted Bundy's grasp, agreed to further questioning by the police. She was given a pile of mug shots and was asked if any of the men pictured was her attacker. Ted Bundy's photo was in the pile, but she only found him vaguely familiar. She could not make a positive identification of any of the men. She was asked to look at a lineup of suspects, and she promised she would. A woman who had met Bundy at Viewmont High School the night of the play recognized Bundy from his mugshot. Other promising leads included gas receipts from Chevron stations that were located near the scenes of his murders. Bundy realized that Detective Jerry Thompson was looking into his background, which included examining his banking records. He also investigated all information documented on Bundy at the university. Bundy caught up with Thompson one day and taunted him. Their conversation went as follows. Jerry seemed to be a pretty good detective. I think I'm a damn good detective. But Jerry, you're just grasping at straws. Just straws, Jerry. But you keep at it, Jerry. If you find enough straws, maybe you can put a broom together. Bundy was still too arrogant to think that this insinuation was prophetic and damaging to his prospects of acquittal. October 1st, Ted Bundy was subpoenaed to appear as part of a lineup. October 2nd, on the day of the lineup, three witnesses were present. Raylynn Shepard, a drama teacher from Viewmont High, Tamara Tingey, a locker maid of Debbie Kent, who remembered seeing Bundy the night of Kent's disappearance, and Carol Deranche. They all picked Ted Bundy out of the lineup as the man they remembered from their encounters with the suspect. Ted Bundy was formally charged with kidnapping and attempted murder. His bail was set at $100,000, approximately $400,000 when adjusted for inflation. He was in jail for two weeks until his bond was reduced to $15,000. A friend of his from Washington, Marlon Vortman, was the person he contacted when allowed his only phone call. Vortman had connections in high places and came to his friend's aid. His other friends and associates were shocked to hear that their friend Ted was being accused of such grisly crimes. Some were doubtful of his culpability, but that would change throughout the trial. November 10th. Detective Thompson made a courtesy call to the King County Ted Task Force. He informed them that Ted Bundy made bail and faced no restrictions on travel. Bundy returned to Washington. This was where his true friends were, and many of them were convinced of his innocence. Some also gave him a place to stay, financial support, and contributions to his legal fund. Though Liz was on the brink of cutting him out of her life when his arrest came to light, he persuaded her to stop cooperating with the authorities, which was noted in a Seattle Police Department report on December 1st. He was under surveillance. They did all they could to ensure Bundy would not kill again. Bundy was aware of this and attempted to put a stop to it with the assistance of a public defender. He was unsuccessful in doing so. Tailing a suspect isn't easy when they know they are being tailed. Building the case against him also wasn't easy, since there was no hard evidence that he committed the murders. 
There was evidence that he frequented the area where they were committed, but none of the items documented were directly linked to the crimes. In Utah, the attempted murder charge was dropped due to lack of evidence. The kidnapping charge remained. In the meantime, Bundy's life in Washington was a role reversal, where he became the hunted one. February 23, 1976. Ted Bundy's trial began. Because of the widespread media coverage of Bundy's crimes, it would be impossible to find an impartial jury in the state. This led to John O'Connell's decision on a bench trial, where the guilt or innocence was to be decided by Judge Stuart M. Hansen, Jr. Hansen was reputed to be a judge who examined a case impartially. He was not swayed by public opinion. Bundy was quick to give his consent to this scenario. The state's case depended upon Carol DeRanche's testimony. She convinced the court that she was sincere in citing Ted Bundy as the man who attempted to abduct and murder her. Aside from her account, there was still no evidence that he committed murder. Committed to impartiality, Judge Hansen spent an entire weekend weighing the facts. March 1, 1976. Judge Hansen made this conclusive statement in court. I find the defendant, Theodore Robert Bundy, guilty of aggravated kidnapping, a first-degree felony, as charged. Bundy was remanded to the Salt Lake County Jail, where he was incarcerated for the next few months. Investigators dismantled Bundy's car, which they dubbed the Death Wagon. Forensic specialists analyzed samples taken from the interior. Detective Michael Fisher describes their findings. The lab tech was right on time, and we rolled the car out, and we began doing an interior search before we removed anything. A few hairs were found behind the back seat area. The side panels came out on the passenger side window, and below the weather felt that seals glass from the inside of the door, we found blood. The blood had run down between the glass and the felt that keeps the inside of the door sealed, and samples were taken and photographed. The headliners came out as the search continued, with samples of hair found being photographed in place and then mounted for comparison. A woman who spotted Ted Bundy lurking at a Colorado hotel identified him from mug shots. Bundy was questioned again, this time about the Colorado killings. The interrogation accomplished nothing, as he not only denied committing those homicides, but he insisted he never killed anybody. March 30th, 1976, Ted Bundy appeared in court, officiated by Judge Hansen. It was a sentencing hearing. Bundy became unhinged and tearfully appealed to Hansen for about an hour. He told him that a travesty of justice had occurred because he was innocent his request for leniency was denied. Bundy was sentenced to serve 1 to 15 years in a Utah state prison. October 1976, Mike Fisher witnessed as Judge George Lohr signed an arrest warrant for Ted Bundy. It was a charge of murder for the killing of Karen Campbell. Bundy was escorted by law enforcement officers to Colorado to stand trial for the murder. He was taken there on the morning of January 28, 1977. He was roused out of bed at 2 a.m. The reason for this was out of concern for Bundy's safety. Fisher explained the reason for this years later. The reason we were so secretive about our plan was to avoid a family member of the victims electing to inflict a little early justice by intercepting us. He was taken to Aspen and housed in a cell of the very antiquated Pitkin County Courthouse. Because of a newly introduced health ordinance, prisoners could not be kept in an Aspen jail for longer than 30 days. Bundy was transferred to Garfield County Jail. In April, preliminary hearings were underway. Samples of hairs were found in Bundy's car, matched those taken from the bodies of Carol Durange, Melissa Smith, and Karen Campbell. One setback for investigators was when the woman who spotted Bundy lurking at a hotel, Elizabeth Harder, could not point him out in court. 
she mistook an undersheriff for Bundy. Once these hearings were concluded, Judge Lohr gave Bundy the right to contribute to his own defense. He didn't have much confidence in his court-appointed attorney, Charles Leidner. He also wanted access to a law library and all other privileges normally afforded to lawyers. Bundy had a right to access these resources, and they were granted to him by Judge Lohr. Bundy's jailers were warned that Bundy would want to escape and would take advantage of any opportunity to do so. The staff at the jail were complacent in their abilities to lock the place down. They were skeptical that such a thing was within the realm of possibility. Nobody at any level of law enforcement should have ever underestimated Ted Bundy for any reason. On June 7, 1977, someone left a window opened on the second floor of the courthouse. He jumped out of the window and ran to freedom. He prepared for this escape by dressing in layers so he could strip himself of the clothing he wore at the courthouse and continue with an entirely new outfit. Bundy was a master of disguise. This is evident in the many photographs that were taken of him. He was a veritable chameleon, changing hairstyles, facial hair, clothing, and other details of his appearance. This often made it difficult for surviving witnesses to identify him. His escape was more difficult and stressful than he anticipated. He got lost in the forest for five days. He found a cabin and broke in. He spent the night there and ate what he could find. He found a 22 rifle and some shells, a flashlight, blankets, and a first aid kit. He took them all with him. He wasted away from the lack of food and he was in pain from swelling in his knee and ankle. The last day he spent in the wilderness was chaotic. Helicopters circled the area. When he returned to the cabin, he found that there were hundreds of footprints around it. An armed landowner didn't recognize him and warned him that there was a manhunt in effect for Ted Bundy. Bundy eventually found his way to Aspen, a place he'd wanted to avoid. His only option for escape at this point was to steal a car. He stole Cadillac with designs on driving to Denver. The problem was an avalanche partially blocked the road that led out of town. He was forced to reroute his escape. A car was found by police to be driving erratically. Assuming that the driver was inebriated, he pulled him over. The driver was not drunk. The driver was Ted Bundy, though. With escape charges added to his record, he was strongly urged to hire an attorney. He was now wearing leg irons and chains, even in court. Even so, the staff at the jail from whence he escaped still had not taken any more preventative measures to ensure prisoners could not escape. Bundy requested a change of venue, since all the media coverage in the surrounding area would just about nullify the chances of enlisting an impartial jury. The trial was moved to El Paso Bounty. Bundy would learn that the facility that would incarcerate him in El Paso was escape-proof. He knew he had to act now to prevent that. There was a loose light fixture in his cell. A fellow prisoner lent him a hacksaw. He cut at the welds until he was able to remove the light fixture entirely. He hoisted himself up and passed through a crawl space above the cells. After doing so, he returned to the cell, leading the jailers to believe that nothing was out of the ordinary. The jailers knew about the loose light fixture, but never got around to hiring a welder to repair it. The other prisoners were even aware of what Bundy had done. After his escape, many of the staff were fired. Local newspapers referred to them as the Keystone Cops. Bundy escaped December 30th. He placed several items on his bed and pulled over the covers so that the mass beneath them would resemble a human body. Wearing street clothes, he slipped down from the ceiling to the closet of an apartment, which had access to the outside world. He fled to the streets of Glenwood Springs. He had $700 in his pocket, donations that were made to his defense fund. He was unable to steal a car. He was given a ride by a soldier. Then he took unregistered transport in the form of a Greyhound bus. He went to Denver and flew to Chicago, where he would start over. 
17 hours would pass before the jailers would discover he had left. After arriving in Chicago, Bundy, still unrecognized, took an Amtrak train to Ann Arbor, Michigan. It was January 1st, 1978, and he checked into the downtown Ann Arbor YMCA. Bundy went to the university library to research universities with an ocean front. He chose Florida State University at Tallahassee. He stole a car and headed south. Once in Tallahassee, Bundy adopted the alias of Chris Hagen. He rented a room in the university district. He was not recognized by anybody, so he was able to enjoy his new life there. He couldn't apply for a legitimate job since all official ID bore his fugitive name. He earned money through stealing credit cards and material items. Bundy never did like work. Whether it was for school or money, his dedication was always short-lived. He was a career criminal. Detective Mike Fisher arranged to have Ted Bundy placed on the FBI's 10 most wanted list. He had no inkling of where Bundy had gone, so there was no recourse but to make the manhunt federal. Now that Bundy was free to move undetected, his homicidal impulses could find expression. He became consumed with a bloodlust once again. He was surrounded by beautiful young female university students. Many of them had long hair parted in the middle as it was still trendy at this point in the 1970s. A change came over him. His homicidal impulses were darker and more colored by anger than ever before. He was so blinded by rage he would make careless mistakes. He no longer planned his murders carefully. There would be very little in the way of charming women to their deaths. A monster was at large. He even used his teeth to bite his victims, as if he were a feral animal, with the goal of sending a message to all who dared to stand in his way with the teeth marks as a warning. January 1978, Chi Omega Sorority House, 3 a.m. Nita Neary, 20 years old, returned to Chi Omega after a date with her boyfriend. She was about to enter the combination in the side door when she discovered it was unlocked. Once inside, she locked the door behind her. Numerous lights were left on, yet there was no sign of activity. She shut them off. She heard a thud. She wondered if her boyfriend fell down the stairs upon leaving. She ran to the window to see if that was the case. He was gone. Nita walked through the lower level of the house. She heard the sound of running above her. She assumed it was one of her housemates. So she went to the foyer. She stopped short when a man ran down the steps and crouched by the front door. She was frozen in place. He turned the doorknob with his left hand. In his right, he held a club of some kind. Before she knew it, he was gone. Nita later described him as wearing a blue winter hat, pulled down close to his eyes. He wore a blue jacket and a light color of pants. She told officers he was a white male, young, 5'8 inches tall, and approximately 160 pounds. Thin build, clean shaven, dark complexion, large nose. She lived to tell the story because the man didn't see her. He ran out into the night, club in hand which was dripping with blood. He attempted to abduct a young woman named Cheryl Rafferty earlier that evening, and she gave a similar description. She was shown a photograph of Ted Bundy. She said he was probably the man who tried to abduct her. Bundy also took to peering in windows in search of victims. Bundy was spotted at a popular disco called Sherrod's. He was hunting for victims there. Carla Black remembered him from the club. She found his countenance and behavior off-putting. He was not dressed like males who frequented the establishment with regularity. He was older than them for one thing. Also, Carla recalled that he was staring at her. She felt uncomfortable and was worried he would ask her to dance. He stared at a lot of the women in attendance. She described his mannerisms as rude type of looking and, quote, that he appeared to be smirking or that he felt superior, or a uh, I know something that you don't know attitude. 
back at Chi Omega, Nita Neary woke her roommate, Nancy Dowdy, to tell her about the male intruder. They went downstairs to check on everybody. When they went back upstairs, they woke Jackie McGill, the house president. Suddenly, Karen Chandler came out of room number eight. She was staggering. She held her head. She could barely speak, only a faint plea for help. She was bleeding profusely and moaning. She cradled her head in her own hands. The girls led her into a room and laid her down on a bed. Calls were made to police and paramedics. Meanwhile, Kathy Kleiner, Karen Chandler's roommate, was found, and it didn't look good. She was sitting up in bed, moaning and rocking back and forth. She was coated with drying blood. Both Karen and Kathy had broken jaws and head lacerations. Three of Kleiner's teeth were left behind on her bed. Karen was cut on her right hand. Her right index finger was almost severed just below the middle finger. The scene was examined in minute detail by law enforcement, and Sergeant Howard Winkler included the following in his report. This writer proceeded to room number eight and observed blood on both beds. Blood was also located on walls around both beds and on the ceiling between the windows and light fixture. A BOLO, or Be on the Lookout Alert, was issued to all law enforcement agencies and police cruisers in the surrounding area. At about this time, Lisa Levy's body was found lying face down in her room. She had no pulse. EMTs performed CPR, but it was too late. She was beaten savagely like the other victims, but strangulation was determined post-mortem to be the cause of death. Bundy bit her in the buttocks. He chewed on one of her nipples. He chewed it so hard, he nearly ripped it off. Officer Henry Newkirk was asked by one of the survivors to check on room number nine, where Margaret Bowman lived. She had not emerged from her room, and they were concerned. Newkirk wrote this in his report. This writer entered room number nine and immediately closed the door behind me once I observed blood on a pillow. Miss Bowman was lying on the bed in the southwest corner of the room with her head and feet pointing in the south-north direction, respectively. The bedspread was covering Miss Bowman's entire body with the exception of her head, which was tilted to the right lying on her pillow. Her face was facing the west wall. This writer pulled back the cover, bedspread, and observed Miss Bowman had been strangled with a pair of nylon pantyhose. Her legs were bent outwardly slightly and spread open. Miss Bowman was lying on her stomach. Her right arm was extended down her side and her left arm was bent with her elbow facing east and her left hand resting on her back. Both palms of her hands were turned upwards. This writer turned Miss Bowman over onto her right side to check for a heartbeat or pulse and discovered neither. This writer looked at Miss Bowman's head and observed where Miss Bowman had received a crushing blow to her right forehead, coupled with what appeared to be puncture wounds in the same vicinity. Massive bleeding occurred from both the forehead and the right ear. Additionally, Miss Bowman's neck appeared to be disjointed leading this writer to believe there was a possible neck fracture. Miss Bowman's body was relatively warm to the touch, and her eyes were glassy with pupils dilated. That night, when a young woman was leaving Sherrod's, an unknown male called out to her, saying, Are you a Chayo? She said she wasn't, that she belonged to another sorority. His response, You're lucky. 4 a.m., Debbie Ciccarelli of 431B Dunwoody Street thought she heard a commotion in the apartment of her neighbor, Cheryl Thomas. It sounded like she was crying and pleading with someone. This was followed by what she described as a, quote, loud pounding noise coming from the apartment. After the racket ceased, Debbie and her roommate, Nancy, called out to Cheryl to see if she was okay, but there was no response from Cheryl. They called her on the telephone, but she did not pick up. They did hear someone walking around her apartment. They were alarmed now. They called the police. Ted Bundy was that someone. 
He had just bludgeoned Cheryl's face, head, and jaw with a club, which turned out to be a log he found near the Chai Omega house. It was the same log used to kill and maim those girls. Cheryl wasn't dead yet. He removed his pants and underwear. He was about to strangle her with a pair of pantyhose while sodomizing her. He preferred to do this pre-mortem. He wanted his victims to die during the sexual component of the murder. The tightening of the victims' muscles during their death throes gave him an intense orgasm. It was his favorite part. It's delightful if you're a Ted Bundy sort of person. This was disrupted, however. The phone calls, the shouting neighbors, and the ruckus next door were indicative of an approaching police presence. His conclusive gesture was to masturbate while he admired his handiwork. He eagerly anticipated that the solidity of Cheryl's corpse would become commensurate with the rigidity of his erection. His semen stain was found on her bedsheet by investigators. He didn't strangle her with the pantyhose, leaving them on the floor. He fled through a window. Cheryl Thomas was found by investigators in her bedroom. She was in a semi-conscious state. They knew the child mega killer was responsible for this. She had been battered by a log on the head and face. She was bleeding heavily. She was moaning. Bundy left the log on the floor. Bundy left the log on the floor. Cheryl's jaw was shattered. It would eventually heal, but she sustained hearing loss in one ear that was never recovered. She also has occasional struggles maintaining her equilibrium. After Bundy returned to his rooming house, his roommates would greet him, but he did not respond. He was now consumed by a bloodthirsty mania for homicide. His artificial facade that enabled him to ingratiate himself to politicians and professors had itself become a casualty to his fixation on murder. This was the real Ted Bundy. He was human in body only at this point. His roommates, Russell Gage and Henry Palumbo, recalled that he stood on the front porch, staring at the university. He had a blank expression on his face. They said hello to him, but he did not answer. He did join a group of his fellow roomies to discuss the Chi Omega murders later. Russell recalls one statement that Bundy, still as Chris Hagen, made during this discussion. This was probably a professional job, and this guy has done it before. Ted Bundy continued to steal his living while plotting the deaths of young women. None of the material items he stole filled the holes in his soul like a freshly killed corpse. There wasn't a beverage at the finest cocktail lounge in town that could slake his thirst like blood. He realized that it wouldn't be long before he would have to leave Tallahassee. The city was alive with talk about the murders of the co-eds. Once authorities in the FBI and the states of Washington, Utah, and Colorado found out, he would have to leave. He made a duplicate of another man's birth certificate. Name, Kenneth Raymond Meisner. His objective was to apply for a driver's license under that name. Decades before internet-related security concerns, Ted Bundy was an exceptional identity thief. He drove toward Jacksonville in search of a place where he could kill without arousing more pandemonium. February 9th, 1978, Lake City, Florida. It was the day that Kimberly Ann Leach, 12 years old, disappeared. A firefighter known as C.L. Anderson testified that he saw Ted Bundy with Kimberly Leach. Bundy was pulling her along by her arm. She appeared to be crying. He said Bundy was scowling. He brought her to the passenger side of a stolen van, opened the door, and shoved her in. He slammed the door. He, quote, jogged around to the driver's side and drove off, unquote. He assumed Bundy was her father and decided not to interfere. Kim Leach apparently fought back, as witnesses noticed the van passing back and forth on the road. Bundy drove them to Live Oak, a rural area. He raped her but did not kill her right away. He wanted to be careful about where he left her body. He found a small and empty hog shed. He dragged Kimberly inside the cramped quarters. He held a knife in his hand. He ordered her to lie on her stomach. 
he raped her from behind. As he did so, he stabbed and slashed her throat until she bled out like a stuck pig. He headed back to Tallahassee, but made sure to dump the van beforehand. He cleaned it as best as he could to eliminate fingerprints. Returning to Tallahassee would not be in Ted's best interests at this point. Bob Keppel found out about the murders at Chi Omega and notified Tallahassee authorities about the murders he was alleged to have committed out west. He was detained by a patrolling officer, but managed to escape on foot before he could be identified. February 12th, looking for a vehicle to steal that was in good working condition, Bundy happened upon a beetle whose keys were left inside. Bundy's drive to Pensacola was fraught with difficulties. The car malfunctioned, his stolen credit cards were declined, his destination was the Alabama state line. Around 1.30 a.m., February 15th, he attracted the attention of patrolman David Lee. The car's headlights were off, and when Lee called the license plate number in, he was notified that the car was stolen. He pulled Bundy over. Lee pulled his revolver out and ordered Bundy to lie face down on the pavement. Bundy lay down. Lee asked him if there were any passengers in the car. Bundy didn't answer. Lee cuffed Ted's left wrist. As he was about to cuff the right, Bundy rolled over and hit him in the face. Lee lost his balance. Ted kicked his feet out trying to knock him down. As Lee struggled to remain standing, Ted lunged at him. Lee shot in his direction but missed. Bundy turned and ran away. Lee pursued him. They ran through the streets. At one point, Lee took another shot. Bundy fell to the ground. When Lee walked up to him to inspect the damage, it turned out that Bundy was playing possum. He kicked Lee's feet out from underneath him once more. Ted tried to disarm Lee, but failed. Lee pistol whipped Bundy three times. Ted, bleeding and injured now, fell to the ground. He surrendered as backup arrived. He was fully cuffed this time and taken to Lee's cruiser. On the way to the station, Bundy contemplated the dour prospects of his fate and at one point said, I wish you had just killed me back there. Lee said he didn't want to kill him. Ted's response, if I run at the jail, will you shoot me then? Both men were silent for the rest of the commute. Ted had in his possession 21 stolen credit cards. The transaction records would be damning at his trials. Ted was questioned, and eventually he confessed to being Theodore Robert Bundy. Bundy made some statements that would incriminate him later. In regards to the Chi Omega killings, he said, The evidence is there. Look for it. Other quotes. I want you to understand me so you can understand my problem. Speaking in the third person, he said, he never enjoyed the act, but he had to do it to keep the fantasies up. The act is a downer. What was the act? I'm not going to tell you modus operandi. He spoke about a girl he saw walking as he rode his bicycle. I had to have her at any cost. Sometimes I feel like a vampire. I never hurt anybody I know. He was granted two hours of telephone time, and he called Liz Kendall. She was later questioned by Detective Keppel about the call. The following is an excerpt from their dialogue. Liz, he said he wanted to talk about what we'd been talking about in the first phone call. And I said, you mean about being sick? And he said, yes. He told me that he was sick and was consumed by something he didn't understand, and that, uh, that he just couldn't contain it. Keppel asked her why Ted couldn't control it. Liz, well, he said that he tried. He said that it took so much of his time, and that's why he wasn't doing well in law school, and that he couldn't seem to get his act together, because he spent so much time trying to maintain a normal life, and he just couldn't do it. He said that he was preoccupied with this force. Uh, he told me that I asked him if I somehow played a part in what happened, and he said no. Uh, he told me that I asked him if I somehow played a part in what happened, 
and he said that no, for years before he met me, he'd been fighting the same sickness, and that when it broke, we just happened to be together. Uh, he mentioned an incident about following a sorority girl. Uh, he didn't do anything that night, but uh, he just told me that's how it was, that he was out late at night, and he would follow people like that, but that he tried not to, but he just did it anyway. Uh, he did talk about Lake Sammamish. He told me that he was... He started by saying that he was sick, and he said, I don't have a split personality, and I don't have blackouts. He said, I remember everything that I've done. And he mentioned the day, July 14th, when two women were abducted from Lake Sammamish. And we went out to eat around 5 o'clock, and he was saying that he remembered that he ate two hamburgers and enjoyed every bite of it. And that when we went to Farrell's, and he said that it wasn't that he had forgotten what he'd done that day or that he couldn't remember, but just said that it was over. Later on, Liz details the results of probing Bundy to talk about the murders in Tallahassee. Liz, I asked him specifically about the Florida murders, and he told me he didn't want to talk about them. But in the phone conversation, he said that he felt like he had a disease, like alcoholism, or something like alcoholics that couldn't take another drink. And he told me it was just something that he couldn't be around. And he knew it now. And I asked him what that was. And he said, don't make me say it. Later, at a deposition, Bundy, acting as his own attorney, questioned Detective Norman Chapman about a statement Ted made about the Kimberly Leach case. Chapman said, I asked Mr. Bundy, we were talking about certain things, and I asked Mr. Bundy, I told him, and I said, Ted, I will go to the best of my knowledge and locate the girl, find the body, and let her parents know where she's at. And Mr. Bundy replied that I cannot do that to you because the sight is too horrible to look at. Bundy agreed to disclose the details of the crimes he was alleged to have committed only on condition that he be extradited back to Washington. Florida officials had sunk their teeth in and weren't willing to let him go so easily. April 7, 1979. The body of Kimberly Leach was found. It was severely decomposed. Ted chose to work in tandem with other defense attorneys, though sometimes he ignored their advice and hindered their ability to be effective. His one experience at practicing law was infused by enthusiasm, but would prove to be self-defeating. He cited himself as chief counsel and the public defender as associate counsel. His defense attorneys, Mike Minerva and Millard Farmer, objected when he refused to submit an insanity plea. They felt that making such a move would ensure that he would receive the death penalty. Bundy didn't see any aspect of his crimes as having occurred outside the realm of sanity. The severing of his victims' heads and scattering them throughout the wilderness, fucking the dead, this didn't strike him as psychologically abnormal. He simply referred to it as, quote, my problem. He once told a writer that committing murder was his way of, quote, acting out. He frequently used such euphemisms when referring to his most heinous offenses. He was offered a plea deal that would keep him alive at a time when the entire state of Florida was calling for his blood. He would receive three life sentences without the possibility of parole in a prison in Florida. No extradition at any point to Washington. All prosecutors, the judge, even the families of the victims all agreed to this deal. Even Bundy's attorneys felt he should take it. It was the best deal Bundy could get. The catch was that he would be required to confess in court that he did indeed commit the crimes for which he was charged. May 31st, 1979. All persons involved in the case gathered in court to find out if Bundy would agree to the plea bargain. Bundy fired his lawyers and rejected the plea. The case went to trial. The venue was changed from Tallahassee to Miami. The trial for the Chai Omega murders began on July 23, 1979. The trial did not go well for Bundy. 
Nita Neary took the stand and correctly identified Bundy when she was asked to point him out. More damning than this was the photographic evidence of the bite mark left on Lisa Levy's buttocks. More damning than this was the photographic evidence of the bite mark left on Lisa Levy's buttocks. Dr. Richard Soveron proved beyond a shadow of a doubt that the bite was produced by Ted Bundy's teeth. This struck a blow on his case from which he would never recover. That very day, Ted Bundy was found by the jury to be guilty of the murders of Lisa Levy and Marguerite Bowman, the assaults and attempted murders of Kathy Kleiner and Karen Chandler, and the burglary of the house. The lawyers Bundy fired warned him that this would happen. Ted was granted an opportunity to appeal for clemency to Judge Cowart before sentencing. He played the part of the put-upon wrongly accused as he said, I find it somewhat absurd to ask for mercy for something I did not do, so I will be tortured for and suffer for and receive the pain for the act, but I will not share the burden of the guilt. Judge Cowart sentenced Ted to what he referred to as, quote, a current of electricity sufficient to cause your immediate death, unquote. Bundy would go on to launch appeals, a process that proved to be long-lasting and unsuccessful. January 7, 1980, the trial for the murder of Kimberly Leach began. This time the evidence was overwhelming. There were eyewitnesses to the abduction. Credit card receipts proved he was in the area and noted specific times when purchases were made. Most damning of all, hairs found in the van and on its carpet matched those of Kimberly Leach. February 6, 1980, Ted Bundy was found guilty of murder. January 24, 1989, Theodore Robert Bundy was executed on the electric chair. A crowd gathered outside the prison. Some people sold t-shirts and other souvenirs. Here are some more quotes by Ted Bundy on why he kept skulls and other body parts of his victims. When you work hard to do something right, you don't want to forget it. On his perception of victims, I have known people who radiate vulnerability. Their facial expressions say, I am afraid of you. These people invite abuse. By expecting to be hurt, do they subtly encourage it? On his feelings regarding the remains of his victims, the ultimate possession was, in fact, the taking of the life, and then the physical possession of the remains. On being an outsider, I didn't know what made things tick. I didn't know what made people want to be friends. I didn't know what made people attractive to one another. I didn't know what underlay social interactions. On remorse, guilt. It's this mechanism we use to control people. It's an illusion. It's a kind of social control mechanism and it's very unhealthy. It does terrible things to our body. On the way in which murder affects the killer, Murder is not just a crime of lust or of violence. It becomes possession. They are part of you. The victim becomes a part of you, and you two are forever one. And the grounds where you kill them or leave them become sacred to you, and you will always be drawn back to them. On the moment when the victim dies, when you feel the last bit of breath leaving their body, you're looking into their eyes, a person in that situation is God. This is his confirmation that he was a human monster. I'm the most cold-hearted son of a bitch you'll ever meet. This is an interview with Rhonda Stapley on the Dr. Phil show about an encounter with Ted Bundy she survived. Tell me how you encountered Ted Bundy. It was October of 1974. I was a a pharmacy student at the University of Utah in Salt Lake City. I was at a city park waiting for a bus to take me back up to campus. The bus was late. I was getting frustrated. And then this tan Volkswagen drove by very slowly, 
cute driver kind of looked at me as we went past and then he stopped and backed up and leaned over and rolled down the passenger window and asked me where I was going. I told him I was going up to the U and he said, me too, hop in. So I opened the door and got in. The first thing that I noticed was the inside passenger door handle was missing and he leaned over and pulled the door shut, but I wasn't alarmed. I figured college, kid, college car, things fall off. How does he look to you at the time? He looked like a college student. He was dressed nice, had a green pullover, sweater on, nice slacks. And you say, okay, because he looks like the fabric of the university community. He didn't look like an outsider. He didn't look like we would think about a predator. Right. So you drive off, and what was his demeanor? Lighthearted. We just had the normal conversation that strangers would have. I told him, my name's Rhonda, and I'm a pharmacy student. What are you studying? He told me his name was Ted, and he was a law student. In a, just a couple of blocks, he turned a way that wasn't the normal route to the university. And I asked him about that, and he was very polite and asked my permission if it would be all right if he took a little detour. He told me he had to run an errand up by the zoo, and I told him that would be fine. I didn't care. I thought I would still be home faster than if I had waited for the bus. And then we went right on past the zoo, and I said, hey, I thought we were taking me to the zoo. And he said, no. I said, near the zoo. That road goes over the hill and drops down into Parley's Canyon, which is the main highway back into the city. Nothing's gone off in your head yet? Nothing's gone off. We're just having fun. We get to the bottom of that canyon, and we should have turned right to go towards campus. And instead, he turned left and started driving up another canyon. And as he's driving, he's kind of looking at parking places and side roads. The conversation started to go weird then because he stopped talking to me. And I'm still trying to make idle conversation. And, and I'm thinking that he's probably looking for a place to pull off in the park and wants to make out. And, I don't know him and I'm not really a makeout person, but he's still a cute law student and I don't want to offend him and I don't want to embarrass myself. So I'm thinking of how do I get out of this situation? And then he pulled into a parking place and, and parked the car and turned it off. So at this point you think, I'm gonna have to fend off a romantic advance. Yes. And then he turned in the car seat so he's kind of facing me and he leaned in really close I thought he was going to kiss me. Instead, he said very quietly, do you know what? I'm going to kill you. And he put his hands on my throat and started squeezing. My first thought was, it has to be some kind of a joke. This guy's got a weirdest sense of humor. But that was just maybe a fraction of a second because I realized he was squeezing too tightly. He was serious and I was in trouble. And there's no door handle. What did you do? We had a little small battle in the car, but I went unconscious. So he choked you to the point of unconsciousness? Yes. Did you put up a fight? I did as much of a fight as you can put up when you're running out of air. Did you think at that point? I'm going to die. You think I'm dying in this Volkswagen bug right here? I thought I was going to die right there in the car, but he had other, other plans. Ted Bundy's ex-girlfriend, Liz Kendall, speaks to Nightline about her relationship with Ted. I still have a sense of disbelief that this man that I love could go out and do such horrific things. To Liz Kendall, Ted Bundy was not a sadistic murderer who killed dozens of women. Mr. Ted Bundy, you've been involved in uh, how many uh, homicides? No, we came up with 30. But the man she loved. Is it fair to say, at least at first, that Ted Bundy was a gentleman? Oh, completely. My parents loved him. He was just really it, in my opinion. And I really wanted to marry him. He was like a father to her daughter, Molly, seen here together in these childhood photos. I adore this man. They were together for about five years, while Bundy secretly began his descent into a serial murderer. There were two Bundys. The only people that ever saw the diabolical Bundy were his victims. At first, Liz didn't want to believe that her smart, charming, and charismatic boyfriend could be a serial murderer. You thought he was innocent. I did. Now, in the new Amazon Prime series, Ted Bundy falling for a killer, he is seen through the eyes of Liz and Molly, the women who knew him best. 
we were like a family. They're breaking their silence after nearly 40 years in the docu-series and in a book, The Phantom Prince, My Life with Ted Bundy. Liz, I'm sure you've asked yourself, why not me? I hate to even say this because it makes him sound normal, but I do think he loved us. Bundy was in his early 20s when he met Liz Kendall at a bar in Seattle, Washington. Well, I was pretty smitten right from the get-go. She was a young, reasonably naive, single mother from Utah who met the man who was considered by virtually everybody in society and culture in the 1970s as the dream date, the perfect husband material, a prince charming. But there were two sides to Bundy. This is what makes 1974 so extremely different. He determined he's going to launch himself into full-time murder, and he's just going to keep doing it until he was captured or killed. One of his first known victims was 21-year-old Linda Ann Healy, a senior at the University of Washington. Bundy spotted Healy at a bar, followed her home, and strangled her in her bedroom. Can you describe to me what your relationship was like in 1974? Just subtle changes where I felt like maybe I was losing him. You thought maybe, worst case scenario, he's seeing someone else. Yes, never in my dreams did I think he was out stalking women and then eventually abducting and murdering women. Over the next four months, young women in the Pacific Northwest started to go missing. There were no clues whatsoever. I mean, it's kind of remarkable that nobody saw anything. But that changed on July 14th, 1974. Bundy went to Lake Sammamish State Park looking for his next victim. A number of people that day at Lake Sammamish were taking photos and shooting film. A little did they know the police would want to review this footage. Ted was able to meld into the crowd. He was able to convince Denise Naslin and Janice Ott to help him with the ruse that he had a sailboat, that he had his arm in a, a fake sling. If anybody has seen the silence of the lambs, where the killer had that, trying to get that couch into the van and he's got a cast on, that, that all came from Ted Bundy. Jeez. Can I help you with that? Would you? Sure. He kidnapped and killed the two young women. Those abductions were very brazen. And in front of literally thousands of witnesses, police asked the public to send in any video or photos taken that day. People saw him, and he identified himself as Ted. Police knew the suspect drove a Volkswagen and were able to produce this composite sketch. Your co-workers brought over the sketch to show to you? Was it because they thought the sketch looked like Ted? Yes. There was something about it that just grabbed my attention. And there was just something about the jawline or something like that that made me think, wow. And you called Seattle police? Yeah, I called anonymously to a tip line that they had set up. There was something like 3,000 potential Ted's who may or may not drive a Volkswagen, and he was one of them. But he had this terrific, spotless, clean record. You have to understand that detective work was organized in a very different way in the 70s. There was no DNA evidence. Police departments didn't even have fax machines, let alone the internet. Did you ever ask Ted, are you concerned about the similarities? In the very beginning, I asked him, I said, did you read this? Do you know what they're saying? There's so many things here that people are gonna be looking at you, kind of making a joke out of it. But once I started to worry, like, could this be true? I didn't feel safe bringing it up. I didn't want him to know what I was thinking. As the police investigations intensified, Bundy realized he had to leave the Seattle area. He had to find a new killing ground. He used the excuse of going to the Utah Law School. Liz and Molly stayed behind. Bundy drove away. 12 hours later, he killed a hitchhiker in Idaho. In law school, Bundy barely went to class. He's like a kid in a candy store. He upped it in, in Utah, and he killed around four women in, the, in just a matter of 
weeks. But one woman escaped, Carol Durant, who managed to get out of his car after he lured her in pretending to be a police officer investigating a crime. So this is the first time we have an eyewitness of somebody who survives a Bundy attack. My friend came back from Utah and she said, I don't want to scare you, but it, it, it's happening down there now. What did that feel like? Oh my God, like the bottom of my world was falling out. It's like, it's just too much of a coincidence. So I did call King County Police and I did meet with the detective. I gave them some pictures of him and they showed him to the best witness from Lake Sammamish. She pulled his picture out of the stack that the detective had given her. She said, no, he's too old and put it back in the stack. She had multiple contacts with the police, but it kept coming back. He's not your guy. It's the winter of 1975, and Ted Bundy's got to find a place where there's not a lot of talk about missing women. So he heads up the mountains to Colorado. First Aspen, where he finds his next victim, Karen Campbell, a nurse from Michigan. 36 days later, her nude body was found almost three miles away. Two months later, he heads over to Vail and ends up killing 26-year-old ski instructor Julie Cunningham. He was just not going to stop. He had more relationships with dead women by now than living women. It was all about the hunt. But the hunter was about to become the hunted. In Utah later that year, he got stopped by a local cop. In his car, a ski mask, handcuffs, and pantyhose with the eyes cut out. Well, I took him in and booked him. I said, there's something wrong with this guy. That put him on the radar of Utah law enforcement, and they had this unsolved abduction of Carol DeRange. Carol Durant came to the police station, was shown a lineup, and was able to identify Bundy as the person who attacked her. He was arrested and charged with the kidnapping of Carol Durant. At one point, police did show you a photo of the items they found in Ted's car. How could he have possibly explained that away to you? When he tried to just brush it off, oh, you know, I need the crowbar for if I get in a wreck, I need to pry cars apart. I need the ski mask for when I'm shoveling snow. Believing he was innocent, his friends raised money for his bail. While waiting for his trial, Bundy returned to Seattle to see Liz. What was that time like? Well, when he first showed up at my door unannounced, I was taken aback. But we started talking again. It's just like, it's just Ted. Because of our placement in his world, is the only reason that we're still alive, I'm quite certain, because people had their eyes on it. Did that thought ever cross your mind? That he was going to kill us? No. Did you think he was capable of murder? No. I mean, I still believed he was innocent at that point. When we come back, Liz and Molly come to grips with the horrible truth about the man they both loved. I'm going to leave you with an interview Ted Bundy did for television just hours before his execution. Thank you for listening to Human Monsters. Bye for now. Ted, it is uh, about 2.30 in the afternoon. Uh, you are scheduled to be executed tomorrow morning at 7 o'clock if you don't receive another stay. What is going through your mind? What thoughts have you had in these last few days? Well, I won't kid you to say that it's something that I feel that I am in control of or something that I've come to terms with, because I haven't. It's a moment-by-moment -moment thing. Sometimes I feel very tranquil, and other times I don't feel tranquil at all. Um, what's going through my mind right now is to use the minutes and hours that I have left as fruitfully as possible and see what happens. Uh, it helps to, to live in the moment in the, in the essence that we use it productively. So I'm, right now I'm feeling calm and in, in large part because I'm here with you. For the record, you are guilty of killing many women and girls. Is yes, that yes, that's true. Ted, how did it happen? Take me back. 
what are the antecedents of the behavior that we've seen? Uh, so much grief, so much sorrow, so much pain for so many people. Where did it start? How did this moment come about? That's the question of the hour, and, and when one that not only people much more intelligent than I have been working on for uh, for years, but one that I've been working on for years and trying to understand it. Is there enough time to explain it all? Uh, I don't know. I think I understand it, though. Understand what happened to me um, to the extent that I, I, I can see how certain feelings and ideas uh, developed in me to the point where I began to act out on them. Certain very violent and very destructive feelings. Right, let, let's go back then to those roots. First of all, you, as I understand it, were raised in what you consider to have been a healthy home. Absolutely. You were not physically abused. You were not sexually abused. You were not emotionally abused. No, in no way. I, and that's part of the tragedy of this whole situation is because I grew up in a wonderful home with two dedicated and loving parents, one of five brothers and sisters. A home where we as, our, as children were the focus of, of my parents' lives, where we regularly attended church, two Christian parents who did not drink, they did not smoke, there was no gambling, there was no physical abuse or fighting in the home. I'm not saying this was leave it to beaver. It wasn't a perfect home. No, no, I don't know that such a home exists, but it was a fine, solid Christian home, and nobody, uh, I hope no one will try to take the easy way out and to try to blame or otherwise accuse my, uh, my family of contributing to this, because uh, I know, and I'm trying to tell you as honestly as I know how, what happened, and I think this is a message I want to get across. But as a young, uh, a young boy, and I mean the boy of uh, 12 or 13, certainly, uh, that I encountered outside the home again uh, in uh, the local grocery store or the local uh, uh, drug store, the softcore pornography, what people call softcore. Uh, but as I think I, I explained to you last night, Dr. Dobson, in an anecdote, uh, that as young boys do, we explored the, the back roads and sideways and byways of our neighborhood and oftentimes people would dump the garbage and whatever they were cleaning out of their house and from time to time we'd come across so, pornographic books of a harder nature than uh, more uh, graphic you might say more explicit nature than we would encounter let's say in your local grocery store and this also included such things as let's say detective magazines and uh, more hard those that involve violence yes yes and I, I, I and this is something I think I want to emphasize is the the, the, the most damaging kinds of pornography, and my, again, I'm talking from personal experience, uh, hard, real personal experience, the most damaging kinds of pornography are those that involve violence uh, and sexual violence, because the wedding of those two forces, as, as I know only too well, brings about behavior that is just, uh, mm. is just uh, too terrible to describe. Now walk me through that. What was going on in your mind at that time? Okay, before we go any further, I think I mean, it's important to me and, uh, and that, people, that people believe what I'm saying, to tell you that, that I'm not blaming pornography and not saying that it caused me uh, to go out and do certain things. And I take full responsibility for whatever I've done and all the things that I've done. That's not the question here. The question and, and, and the issue is how this kind of literature contributed and helped mold and, and shape the kinds of violent behavior. It fueled your fantasies. Fueled. Well, in, in the beginning, it fuels this kind of thought process. Then, it, at a certain time, it's instrumental in what I would say crystallizing it, make it in, making it into something which is almost an, like a separate entity inside. And that in, at that point, you're at the verge, or I was at the verge of acting out on this on this kind of these kinds of thoughts. Now, I really want to understand that you had gone about as far as you could go in your own fantasy life mm -hmm. with printed material, and you made or printed and video or film, Photo, or film, magazines, yeah. what have you. 
and and then there was the urge to take that little step or big step over to a physical right. uh, event. And it happens. It, it happened in stages, gradually. It doesn't necessarily, not to me at least, happen overnight. My experience with, I'd say, pornography generally, but with pornography that deals on a violent level with the sexuality, um, is that once you become addicted to it, and I look at this as a kind of addiction, uh, like other kinds of addiction, of addiction, you keep, I would keep looking for more potent, more explicit, yeah, more graphic more kinds of material. Like an addiction, you keep craving something which is harder, harder, something which which gives you a greater uh, sense of, of, of uh, excitement. Until you reach the point where the pornography only goes so far. You reach that jumping off point where you begin to wonder if, if maybe actually doing it will give you that which is beyond just reading about it or looking at it. How long did you stay at that point before you actually assaulted someone? Well, yeah, you see, that is a very delicate point in my own development. And we're talking about something, we're talking about having reached a point or a, a gray area that surrounded that point over a course of years. You don't remember years. how long that well, was? I, I would say, I would say a couple of years. And what was, I was dealing with there were very strong inhibitions against criminal behavior, violent behavior that had been conditioned into me, bred into me in my environment, in my neighborhood, in my church, uh, in my school. Um, things which said, no, this is wrong. I mean, this, I mean even to think of it is wrong, but it, certainly to do it is wrong. And you're on, I'm on that edge in these, the last, the, the, you might say, the last vestiges of restraint. Uh, the barriers to actually doing something were being tested constantly and assault, uh, assailed um, through the kind of fantasy life that was fueled largely by pornography. Do you remember what pushed you over that edge? Do you remember well, the decision to go for it? Do you remember where you decided to throw caution to the wind? Again, when you say pushed, I don't. I, I know what you're saying. I don't want to yes, infer again. I, that, I understand that. That, that I was that, 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 that I was clear. some helpless yeah. kind of a victim, and yet uh, we're talking about an influence which, that is, the influence of violent types of media and, and violent pornography, which had an, was, was an indispensable link in the chain of behavior, the, the chain of events that led. To the behaviors, to the to the assaults, to the murders, and what and what have you. <laughs> it's a it's a very difficult thing to describe. Uh, uh, the the sensation of the the uh, of of reaching that point where you, where I knew. It was like something had, say, snapped. That I knew that uh, that I couldn't control it anymore. That these barriers that that I had had been uh, I had learned as a child uh, that had been instilled in me were not enough to hold me back with respect to seeking out and, and harming somebody. Would it be accurate to call that a a, a frenzy, a sexual frenzy? Well, yes, it, that's one way to describe it—a compulsion, a a. a building up of, of this destructive energy. Uh, again, uh, I, uh, another factor here that we, I haven't mentioned is the use of alcohol. But I think that th what alcohol did uh, in conjunction with, let's say, my exposure to uh, pornography was alcohol reduced my inhibitions at the same time. Um, the, uh, the, the fantasy life that was fueled by pornography eroded them further. In the early days, you were nearly always about half drunk when you did these things, is that right? Yes, yes. Uh, was that always true? I, I would say that that was generally the case, yeah. almost with, with, 
without exception. All right, if I can understand it now, there's this battle going on within. There are the conventions that you've been taught. There's the right and wrong that you learned as a child. Mm -hmm. And then there is this, this uh, unbridled passion uh, fueled by uh, your plunge into hardcore violent pornography. And those things are at war with each other. Yes. And then with the uh, alcohol diminishing the, uh, the inhibitions, uh, you let go. Well, yes, and to, you can summarize it that way, and that's accurate, certainly. And it, it just occurred to me that some people would, would say that, well, I've, I've seen that stuff, and it doesn't do anything to me. And I can understand that. I don't, virtually everyone uh, can be exposed to so-called pornography, and while they're aroused to it to one degree or another, they're not go out and do anything wrong. Well, the addictions are like that. They affect some yeah. people more than they affect others. Well, but there is a percentage of people affected by hardcore pornography in a very violent way, and you're obviously one of them. That was a major component, and I don't know why I was vulnerable to it. All I know is that, uh, that, it, uh, that it had an, an impact on me uh, that was just so... Uh, central to the development of the violent behavior that I engaged in. Ted, after you committed your first murder, what was the emotional effect on you? What happened in the days after that? Well, again, this, please understand that, that even all these years later, it is very difficult to to talk about to it and, and, and reliving it through talking about it uh, is, is uh, difficult to say the least, but I want you to understand uh, what happened. It was like coming out of some kind of horrible trance or, or dream. Um, I can only liken it to after, you know, I, I don't want to over dramatize it, but to have been possessed by something so awful and so alien and then the next morning wake up from it remember what happened and realize that basically I mean in, in the eyes of the law certainly in the eyes of God you're responsible and, and to have to wake up in the morning and and realize what I had done and with a clear mind and all my essential moral and ethical feelings intact at that moment uh, absolutely horrified that I was capable of doing something like that. You really hadn't known that before? Uh, there is just absolutely no way to describe first the brutal urge to do that kind of thing and then what happens is once it it has been more or less satisfied and recedes, you might say, or is spent, that, that sense, that kind of energy level recedes. And basically, I became my, myself again. I, I want people to understand this too, and I'm not saying this gratuitously because it's important that people understand this. That basically, I was a normal person. Uh, I, I wasn't uh, some guy hanging out uh, at bars or a bum or. Um, I wasn't a pervert in the sense that, you know, people look at somebody and say, I know there's something wrong with him and just tell. I mean, I, I, I was essentially a normal person. I had good friends. I, I, uh, I led a normal life, except for this one small but very potent and very destructive segment of it that I kept very secret and very close to myself and didn't let, let anybody know about it. And part of the shock and horror for my dear friends and family when, years ago when I was first arrested was that they just, there was no clue. They looked at me and they looked at the, you know, the, um, the all-American boy. And I'm, uh, I mean, I wasn't perfect, but it was, it was, it, I want yeah, to be quite candid with you. I was, I was okay. Okay. Uh, I was. And the basic humanity and, and basic spirit that God gave me was intact, but it, unfortunately it became overwhelmed at times. And I think people need to recognize that it's not some kind of... The, 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 those of us who are, who have been so much influenced by violence 
in the media, in particular pornographic violence, are not some kinds of inherent monsters. We are your sons and we are your husbands. And we grew up in regular families. And pornography can reach out and snatch a kid out of any house today. He, he snatched me out of my home. It snatched me out of my home 20, 30 years ago. And, and as diligent as my parents were, uh, and they were diligent in protecting their children, and as good a Christian home as we had, and we had a wonderful Christian home, uh, there is no protection against the kinds, that, the kinds of influences that are loose in the society that, that, that tolerates. Mm. You, you feel this really deeply, don't you? Ted, outside these walls right now, there are several hundred reporters that wanted to talk to you. Yeah. And you asked me to come here from California because you had something you wanted to say. This hour that we have together uh, is not just an interview with a man who's scheduled to die tomorrow morning. I'm here and you're here because of this message that you're talking about right here. You really feel that hardcore pornography and the doorway to it, softcore pornography, is doing untold damage to other people and causing other women to be abused and killed the way you did others. Listen, I'm no social scientist and I haven't done a survey. I mean, I, I don't pretend that I know what John Q. Citizen thinks about this. <clears throat> but I've lived in prison for a long time now. And I've met a lot of men who were motivated to commit violence just like me. And without exception, every one of them was deeply involved in pornography without question, without exception, deeply influenced and consumed by an addiction to pornography. There's no question about it. The FBI's own study on serial homicide shows that the most common interest among serial killers is pornography. Yeah, that's true. And it's, and it's real. It's true. Ted, what would your life have been like without that influence? You can only speculate. Yeah. Well, I, I know it would have been far better, not just for me, and, and it's, uh, excuse me for being so self-centered here, it would have been a lot better for me and lots of other people. I know that I had lots of other innocent people, victims and families. It would have been a lot better, there's no question, but that it would have been a, a, a fuller life, a, a certainly a, a life that would not have involved, I'm absolutely certain, would not have evolved, involved this kind of violence that I have been, that I have committed. I'm uh, sure, Ted, if, you know, if I were able to ask you the questions that are being asked out there, Mm -hmm. uh, one of the most important as you come down to perhaps your final hours. Are you thinking about all those victims out there and their families well, who are so wounded, you know, years later, their lives have not returned to normal. They will never return to normal. Absolutely. Are, are you carrying that load, that weight? Is the remorse there? I know that people will accuse me of being self-serving, but we're beyond that now. I mean, I'm just telling you how I feel. But through God's help, I have been able to come to the point where I... Much too late, but better late than never, feel the hurt and the pain that I am responsible for. Yes, absolutely. In the past few days, myself and a number of investigators have been talking about unsolved cases murders that I was involved in and it's hard to it's hard to talk about all these years later because it revives in me all those terrible feelings and those thoughts that I have steadfastly and, 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 and diligently dealt with and I think successfully with the love of God and yet it's reopened that and I felt the pain and I felt the horror again of all that and I can only hope that 
those who I have harmed, those who I've caused so much grief, even if they don't believe my expression of sorrow and remorse, will believe what I'm saying now, that there is loose in their towns and their communities, people like me today, whose dangerous impulses are being fueled day in and day out by violence in the media in its various forms, particularly sexualized violence. And what scares me, and let's come into the present now, because what I'm talking about happened 30, 20, 30 years ago, that is, in my formative stages. And what scares and appalls me, Dr. Dobson, is when I see what's on cable TV, <laughs> some of the movies, I mean, some of the violence in the movies uh, that come into homes today with stuff that they, that they wouldn't show in yeah. X-rated adult theaters 30 years ago. This stuff... The slasher is, movies that you're talking about. That stuff <clears throat> is, I'm telling you, from personal experience, the most that is graphic violence on screen, particularly as it gets into the home to children who may be unattended or, or unaware that they may be a Ted Bundy who has that, that vulnerability to that, that predisposition to be influenced by that kind of behavior, by that kind of, of, of movie, that kind of violence. There are kids sitting out there switching the TV dial around and come upon these movies late at night or I don't know when they're on but they're on and any kid can watch them it's scary when I think what would have happened to me if I had seen I'm scary enough I mean that I just ran into stuff outside the home but to, to, be, to, to know that children are watching that kind of thing today or can pick up their phone and dial away for it or send away for it uh, can you help me understand this desensitization process that took place. Uh, what was going on in your mind? Well, by desensitization, I, I describe it in specific terms, is that each time I'd harm someone, each time I'd kill someone, there'd be an enormous amount, uh, 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 especially at first, uh, enormous amount of, of, of horror, guilt, remorse afterwards. But then that impulse to do it again would come back even stronger. Now, believe me, I didn't. F it, it, the unique thing about how this worked, Dr. Dobson, is that I still felt in my regular life the full range of, of guilt and, and uh, remorse about other things, uh, regret, and. Uh, but you had this compartmentalized. This compartmentalized, very well focused, uh, 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 very sharply focused area where I was like a black hole. It was like a, you know, like a crack. And everything that fell into that crack just disappeared. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Uh, one of the, the final uh, murders that you committed, of course, uh, was apparently little Kimberly Leach, 12 years of age. Uh, I think the, the public outcry is greater there because an innocent child was taken from a, from a playground. What did you feel after that? What was there? Were there the normal emotions three days later? Where were you, Ted? I... Uh, I can't really talk about that right now. That's... weird. That's too painful. I would like to... Uh, I'd like to be able to convey to you what that... that... Uh, that experience is like, but I can't, and I won't okay. be able to talk about that. Okay. I can't begin to understand. Well, I can try, but I, I'm aware that I can't begin to understand the pain that the parents of these, of these children that I have and these young women that I have harmed feel. And I can't restore really much to them, if anything. And I won't pretend to, and I don't even expect them to forgive me, and I'm not asking for it. That, that kind of forgiveness is of God, and if they have it, they have it. If they don't, well, maybe they'll find it someday. 
Do you deserve the punishment the state has inflicted upon you? That's a very good question, and I'll answer very, very honestly. I, I don't want to die. I'm not going to kid you. I'll kid, kid you not. Um, I deserve certainly the, the most extreme punishment society has, and I deserve. I think society deserves to be protected from me and from others like me. That's for sure. Um, I think what I what I hope will come of our discussion is I think society deserves to be protected from itself because, because as, we've, as, as we've been talking, there are, there are forces that loose in, in, in this country, particularly, again, uh, this kind of violent pornography, uh, where, on the one hand, well-meaning, decent people will condemn behavior of a Ted Bundy while they're walking past a a, a magazine rack full of the very kinds of things that send young kids down the road to be Ted Bundy's. That's the irony. We're talking here not just about more. We're talking. I'm, what I'm talking about is going beyond retribution, which is what people want with me. Going beyond retribution and punishment, because there is no way in the world that killing me is going to restore. Uh, those beautiful children to their parents and, and, and correct and, and, and soothe the pain. But I'll tell you, there are lots of other kids playing in streets around this country today who, who are going to be dead tomorrow and the next day and the next day and next month because other young people are reading the kinds of things and seeing the kinds of things that are available in the media today. Ted, as you would imagine, there's tremendous cynicism about you on the outside, and I suppose for good reason. Uh, I'm not sure that there's anything that you could say that people would uh, would believe. Some people would believe. Yeah. And uh, and yet, you told me last night, and I have heard this through our mutual friend John Tanner, that you have uh, accepted the forgiveness of Jesus Christ and uh, are a follower and a believer in Him. Do you draw strength from that uh, as you approach these final hours? I do. I can't say that uh, it's going to be being easy. in the, the the valley of the shadow of death is is something that I've become all that accustomed to, and that I'm you know, and that I'm strong and uh, uh, nothing's bothering me. Uh, listen, it's no fun. It's mm -hmm. it's it, you know it's it's uh, it gets kind of lonely, and yet I have to remind myself that every one of us. Uh, We'll go through this someday yes. in one way or it's another, and, and, man. and countless uh, millions who have walked this earth before us have. So this is just an experience which we all share, and 